Good evening, everybody. Good, Good evening. evening. Oh, you're over there this time, Bill. Bill, How what are you, you doing? doing? You're on the wrong side of the bed. Oh, you know, I gotta, I gotta move you back over there. There you there go. go. Thank you. You know, I guess you get used to sleeping on one side of the bed, and if you go to the reverse, it just. <laughs> Maven, how are you? With everything. I'm doing good. Um, I've been better. Uh, I caught RSV from the nephew, um, so I missed the Christmas Eve show. I was there in the comments and in spirit. I don't actually remember a lot from the show, so I should probably maybe go rewatch it. But I got I got dressed up tonight for it. Um, oh. I got like this kind of my little fancy schmancy dress, and then you can't see it as well. Or at least I can't hear once I take these off, but they're that. little like Christmas bow tie mm -hmm. things. Those are so cute. This is my get up and get fancy for everybody for Christmas Eve, and I couldn't find earbuds, so I might have to take them out. <laughs> a, a quick question about those uh, paper present toppers that you put on that your earrings are designed like. The bows. I never could get those things to stick well, and I always had to take scotch tape and put them on the edges of every one of those things. I, for the folks who make those out there, if you could put better adhesive on those, we would all very much appreciate it. It's like they use the adhesive from sticky notes. Yeah, and, uh, it's about the yeah. same quality. No. Yeah. Well, they have a side <laughs> contract with scotch tape going. Maybe. Um, scotch tape sticks pretty well. I think they're probably using the Duck brand, which is a lot lower quality. Um but anyway, all right, folks, uh, anything from the two of you before we... from duck brand tape in three, two, one, go <laughs> Anything <laughs> before we uh, jump into uh, what I think will be sort of a somber topic tonight, but I think one that uh, our audience will appreciate understanding the history and background in the current standing of the church. But any thoughts from the two of you? Nope. I'm ready to jump in. Sweet. RFM. No, just that I'm I'm so glad that you're with us, even though highly medicated, because your voice is going to be extremely important in tonight's episode. Maven. Yeah, I'm super excited to have you on the show. And so, uh, and I'm glad you're feeling a little better too. And uh, hopefully with a few more days or a week or two, you'll be back to full strength yeah. and moving around. So uh, yeah. tonight, folks, I just want to give you a little heads up. We are going to be talking about abuse, uh, child abuse and sexual abuse. Uh, particularly to women, both uh, girls under age as well as adult women. Uh, so we'll be talking about rape and uh, molestation and those kinds of things. And so just a little warning, if those are things that are going to be a little too sensitive uh, for you at the moment, totally understand. We all have things that trigger us and we all have past uh, experiences in our life or to those that we love that often make it difficult to uh, take on certain issues. And so if tonight... Uh, the issue of abuse is something that is going to be too difficult. We certainly understand. Please step away. Go find some other episode of Mormonism Live or some other show under the umbrella or just take a night off and uh, treat yourself well and uh, take good care of yourself. So tonight, what I thought I would do is start us off sort of sensing how much uh, things aren't going right in Utah. And I don't think it's at all fair in any way to absolve the church. The church has to own that if the health statistics in Utah are worse than the national average, that on some level, the church, because it has so much influence on half the population of the state, has some bearing on that data. And so I want to start off by talking about uh, child abuse. Uh, in Utah, 27 uh, percent, 6,900 cases of abuse, and 27 percent of those abuse of those cases were sexual abuse. And that was the highest. I'm actually going to make my screen a little bigger. Um, Utah stats, nearly 13 percent of Utahns reported being molested before the age of 18. Utah is significantly above the national statistics uh, for this category, which is one in five girls, 21.2 percent, and one in 13 boys, seven 0.6% experienced sexual violence in the last 12 months, 14.3% total. Utah is significantly above the national statistics for this category, which is 10.8 and 16.6 for girls, 5.2 for boys. The only two states with higher rates are Idaho, also a highly Mormon state, and California. And uh, the bottom one there, Utah is higher than the national statistics in this category. And that category is that 
among students who dated in the previous 12 months, 9.5% experienced sexual dating violence one or more times. And Utah is higher than the national statistics, sorry, national statistics there. And uh, so I want to go here to the next one. And just note, Utah rape rates are 33% higher than the U.S. rape rates. And RFM, there was something that you brought up about this. I wanted to give you a second to, to speak to this, and then I'll offer sort of what I talked to you as a counterpoint that sort of gives that a wash as well, so that we, the audience, we want to treat the church fairly here. This is Utah. This isn't church stats. Certainly, you know, a large number, somewhere around half, of course, of these instances are probably occurring with non-members or ex-members of the church. It's not that abuse only happens in Mormonism. It's that Mormonism has such an influence on the state. It gives a nice clean-cut image, but there are lots of ways in which patriarchy is stronger and there are safer spaces for abuse to occur. And if the data says that Utah is exceptionally high, we ought to, as one of the primary reasons, consider what influence the church has in that area. So RFM, in terms of why numbers might be higher, thoughts from you? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a number of factors, obviously, that are going to play into this. We are presuming that this is reflective of Mormon culture because there's so much of it in Utah, and that's what's being reflected in the Utah statistics. The Mormon culture is famous for its law of chastity, which is very, very strictly observed. And I think everybody out there probably knows what I'm talking about. At a minimum, it's not to have any sexual intercourse with anybody other than your spouse after you've been lawfully and legally married, but it extends to things far beyond that, including touching, petting, anything that might arouse you sexually is a violation of the law of chastity, at least as is commonly interpreted and taught within the LDS church. Now, having said that, there's lots of things that are going on here. I was just discussing this with Bill the other day, and I mentioned to him that there is one factor that could lead to an overreporting. all right? Now, I'm sure overall it's underreported, but there are different strains going on here. And we want to be um, fair and balanced in looking at all the possibilities, at least that we can come up with. And one of them is this, is that within a culture that has a strict law of chastity, whether it's Mormon or, or other, if there are two people, let's say it's a, a boy and a girl, a man and a woman, who have sex outside of marriage, which they both know is a violation of the law of chastity, and it comes to light somehow people find out about it. Somehow the girl's parents find out about it. Suddenly, what was initially consensual, now she wants to get off the hook, she's in trouble, so what was initially consensual can now be described as non-consensual. It wasn't my fault, it was the boy's fault. And from there, bad things can happen. Now, I'm not saying that happens in all the cases, okay? But I know it happens in some. I've represented people in those situations. I've heard uh, anecdotally stories about that. And that is also um, a really bad situation. And it, I think, stems from this uh, very strict law of chastity that the LDS church has. If you haven't violated something that is so integral to your membership in the church and that can expose you to ridicule and contempt by your peers and being sanctioned, uh, put on probation or disfellowshipped or even excommunicated, and your, your family and your parents and everything, there's a huge impetus, there's a huge reason to try and make something that might have been consensual, not consensual, once it's found out. Yeah, And you and I brought just, up something else, Bill. Yeah, and I wanna know, so apologists or defenders of the church might be quick to pull out that idea, and I wanted to counter it with another idea, which is, in high demand fundamentalist religions, there is a lot of pressure to not speak up. That we, we uh, whether we were ex-Mormons or whether anybody listening is a, a currently is a believer or faithful member, you, you are in a high demand fundamentalist religion that tells you that there are men in charge, they have priesthood authority, they talk to God, they are responsible to uh to represent god 
to you from, from the leadership perspective. We have these ideas uh, we talked about a couple of weeks ago where the local leader, his job is not to uh, represent the uh, lay members to the leadership. His job is to represent the leadership to the lay members. You have Elder Iring saying that the church makes, God makes no mistakes in his callings. You have uh, lots of moments where the church tells you and shows you that the priority is loyalty to the faith rather than obeying your conscience. And so we ought to see that there are tons of mechanisms that would keep somebody who is a victim, who is abused, keep them from speaking up and speaking out and pointing a finger to a church leader or a male in priesthood and say, that person abused me. And so there are also impetuses for people who do not speak up for why they don't within a high demand religion as well, specifically Mormonism. And so I want to note that also. Yes. And on the other side, which you're representing now, uh, within Mormonism, women, especially all of us are trained and inculcated with the idea that we have respect and deference for our leaders from local leaders all the way up the chain to the general authorities. Women have that more than anybody, mainly because they got more leaders, right? Because the guys have the priesthood and the women don't, and they are trained to respect and honor the priesthood and also to trust those who hold the priesthood and especially offices of authority. And that can put Mormon women in positions that otherwise they would never find themselves in if they were not trained to trust men within the church. And I've got a story on that, which I'll tell whenever you want me to, Bill. Yeah, and you you can share it now or you can share it at a later point where you think it's more fitting. It's completely up to you. I want to and try I'm, to it. Yes, Sorry. Maven? It was <laughs> while you were talking, I just had a coughing fit and I had to go off air, but... um. And I'm hoping, uh, okay, um, I wanted to add that it, it, as far as reporting goes, and we'll get into this more when we get into for strength of youth and stuff. I, I personally have had, you know, friends, uh, roommates, coworkers, a lot of women in the church who like were already were taught to take responsibility for how men act. And so I've, I've been on the, I guess receiving it on the receiving end of some really distressing stories of times where things were, you know, confessed to a bishop. So I, I, I this is me pushing back at RFM, I guess, a little bit. Um, well, you don't have to push back. I think yeah. there's room for both of these to be true. Go right, ahead. right. I just don't think I, I, I think my hesitation is is that saying that it was consensual and now she's in trouble. So now she's saying rape is one of the most common defenses of of. Uh, actual rape i think which she wanted it but now she's you know now she's saying it's not and i think that's very unfortunate but um the number of women that i know who have had things done to them or were coerced into doing things that they didn't want to do but still felt responsible like the idea of consent wasn't even part of it it was just that you know we're responsible for for making men feel this way and so um so just being where we were like i and i can i can get into the stories later i guess but i i do i was surprised that, that the reporting that gets so much higher um the utah stats were so much higher than national average and i still think that there's they're still really really low because i i i just know i personally know a lot of women that did not view or frame what happened to them as something as like akin to a rape or an assault because they there's pieces or steps along the way that they blame themselves for and so it and i know a lot of bishops don't even ask about the consent part of of these kinds of interactions so girls are confessing things without even thinking i and i wouldn't have thought at, at as a teenager that it was, it would be an important point to bring up if it wasn't, if it was anything short of like a, a very violent, obviously aggressive assault, if it was anything less than that. And I was pressured by somebody I know, or a friend or somebody I thought cared about me and that I cared about, you know, I wouldn't, it just wouldn't have crossed my mind to, to think about, well, did I want it to happen in the first place? Cause it's yeah. not, that's not my job. My job is to prevent it from happening and we'll get into that. Yeah. 
So I want to show the next one, uh, Sexual Assault Awareness Month, 33% of women who are raped contemplate suicide, 13% of women who are raped attempt suicide. So we immediately grasp not only is rape in and of itself this horrible, atrocious trauma that any person that, that, that has that happen to them has to deal with for the rest of their life, not even talking about the moment where it happens, but then the after effects and what it does to one's mental health and uh, ability to be happy and to be to feel like life is worth living. Uh, why don't women report rape? Embarrassment, didn't think they'd help, didn't think they'd help would be humiliating, didn't think they'd believe, too trivial, didn't want to go to court, wouldn't be sympathetic, feared more violence, it's a private matter, disliked the police. So you see some of the reasons for why it get, goes underreported. And then you have to ask yourself as we move thro forward through this conversation if Mormonism contributes to that. This was a completely separate facet. I just want to note drug use in Utah is also extremely high. Um, and I don't think we're talking about prescription drugs here. And so the ability of people to cope with how they feel is also something that folks seem to struggle with in the state of Utah. Now, I want to give some time to RFM here to set up a few stories from the Old Testament where I'm hoping, RFM, you'll sort of set the bar for when the church comes into existence, it only knows to borrow from, from the Old and New Testament, and these are some of the stories that are handed down to us. Right. And you, I just want to make it absolutely clear, because you threw that to me early on, Bill. Thanks for that, by the way. Um, uh, I am not saying that all reports of rape are are made up. I'm not saying half of them are made up. I'm saying a very a small percentage are. I think we would be unreasonable to think that none of them are. So having yes. said that, okay, trying to clear my myself there. Let me add to that RFM, yeah. which is probably a very small number of non-rape sexual intimacy is reported as rape. But what you're saying is that in a high demand fundamentalist religion, with the law of chastity and priesthood and patriarchy, the statistically, almost certainly that number is going to be higher than it would be without that influence. I think that's reasonable to conclude. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Hey, so, oh, maybe, just, go ahead. I, I just want to uh, agree with that stance. I think, uh, well, I do think it's far too common for people to be overly concerned about the reputation, the so-called reputation of, of, an alleged perpetrator rather than the victim. And we've seen that over and over and over come up in these cases. Um, I, I do think this is a problem of their own making by having the law of chastity and, and having this, this focus on this, that I, I think if we had an actually healthy, like a sexually healthy society where uh, a, a girl isn't maligned for a sexual experience with a peer, especially if it's consensual, if that's something that's, that's seen as a good thing that she did, she wanted to and she had a good time you know both parties you know there there wouldn't need to be any of this making stuff up to right. to say yeah. that i didn't want to uh, you know right she did she didn't or, you know it just i i agree that page this is it's it's the other side of the coin that they're still causing the same problem for yeah yes and i just want to make sure i mention this too this is a bit of related subject but um in the church and Bill, I hope I'm not getting ahead of myself. I just want to make sure I, I mention this. In, in this church where so much emphasis is placed on the woman in order to not only control her feelings, but also control the feelings of the boys or the men, uh, the young men, what, whatever it happens to be. But And you control that by the way you act, by the way you dress, especially, uh, not provocatively, not in any way that's going to arouse sexual passions from your date okay and that is taught over and over and over again especially to the young women in the church i that's what i understand i was never having been a, a young woman or a young man in the church because i was baptized when i was 18. but i've certainly read the materials and i've heard from others that that's the case that is the case right maven yes okay so when you teach that when you teach that over and over again let me just say yeah, guys and girls, people, human beings are sexual creatures by and large, all right? And the thing is this, is that 
I'll just speak for myself as a young person, okay? I am looking for any way to rationalize uh, doing things that I want to do, which are things that I'm not supposed to do. I think that the human mind is a, a miracle of rationalizing bad behavior, or at least mine. Maybe I'm the only one here. But uh, uh, when the church gives you the excuse to the young men, and by that I mean the church gives the excuse to the young men that they're being aroused and it's the fault of the young whim, woman that they're with, then, I mean, you, you, you've got your excuse. You've got your reason to act in a way that you know you shouldn't, but that you want to. And I think that causes a lot of trouble in the church too. Yeah, RFM, again, I don't want to, we're going to spend a ton of time here in this beginning, but we're all we're laying some groundwork here. We 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 uh, we're part of a church, and for those who believe, they are currently in a church that teaches you that all of your unhealthy thoughts come from this. Uh, I'm going to say imaginary figure out there named Lucifer. It's not you that's thinking them; it's Lucifer placing these thoughts within you. And and then the church goes ahead to the boys and says, if the girls dress immodestly. They're the ones that are causing you to have the impure thoughts. They're the ones that are causing Lucifer to have this safe space to put this new thought in your head that's not even yours. And so when you follow your unhealthy thoughts and inclinations to causing harm to another, and you have the freedom to blame the other person, I don't think any of us would struggle to go, it's more likely that abuse will occur in those situations where you're not responsible for your own thoughts and someone else is responsible for your unhealthy actions. Right. And even though there's pretty much in a stage of allegations still at this point, if we take Tim Ballard as an example of a person who went to incredible lengths to structure things in order to satisfy his sexual urges in a way that was okay Alleged. and justified and rationalized with couples ruse in order to save children. Um, and he is, of course, reflective of this in Joseph Smith as well as in other people, mostly men, who come up with ways to rationalize and make what it is that they're doing something that's for a good cause, believe it or not. And that's what I mean when the miracle making of rationalizing with the human brain. Yeah. So this has been going on for a long time. We have, we get tokens in the temple and both of you know what I'm talking about and you know what those tokens are. However, in the old Testament, there's another token, the tokens of virginity. And what this story has to do with Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 13 through 21. And if a man marries a woman, he goes in, they have sex, and then he hates her. He just doesn't like her. They don't get along. And he decides he's going to make up a story, okay? He's going to make up a story so he can get out of his marriage to her. And that story is that, hey, she wasn't a maid when we got married. In other words, she wasn't a virgin. She's had sex before. Okay. He brings the allegation. Now, this says what happens is that the wife's parents, the father, brings forth the tokens of virginity. And the tokens of virginity are the bloody bedclothes from their first night together, which apparently he's supposed to keep. I don't know how long he's supposed to keep this or how he gets them in the first place. It doesn't exactly spell out the procedure. And then he brings them forward. And if he brings them forward and shows the bloody, the bloody bedclothes, then the man gets fined. Uh, it says immerse, A-M-E-R-C-E. -E. It means find 100 shekels of silver. That's what happens to the husband. However, if for some reason they've forgotten the, the, the tokens of virginity or they, you know, they washed them and they're no longer bloody or whatever, they can't bring back forth the tokens, then the woman gets stoned to death. So that's from Deuteronomy 22. And it speaks to this issue of a patriarchal society, which most societies are, and certainly this society was, the ancient Jewish society, uh, very patriarchal. And men are getting together and trying to come up with ways we can figure out stuff about women that we can't really figure out. You know what I mean? We, we, we have to come up with a way of figuring out. The next example is really crazy. This one, you know, we can sort of understand, right? It sort of makes sense. It's kind of scientific. I don't know if they bring forth the bloody bedclothes and then they send them to the lab in order to be tested for DNA to make sure that they go to this woman or whether they even are human DNA in blood or whether it's some animal's blood. 
I mean, if this happened to my daughter and I'm the father and I don't have the blood clothes or I got the <laughs> misplaced or something, I'm going to go, I'd cut my finger, uh, sacrifice a goat, take the bed clothes along and who's going to be the wiser, right? So there's all sorts of ways I can see of getting around this, but this is their attempt to try and solve this issue. The next one's really interesting, the ordeal of the bitter water. Numbers chapter five. This is one you don't hear in Sunday. I'm, yes. I'm a little slow on it. I just have to jump in. Yeah. I'm going to say that that Please. the idea, uh, just for anyone that may not know, because there is one half of the population that can be very ignorant about the other half, um, that that bleeding is not always a thing. Um, it, it's if uh, especially if um, I guess if if there's proper foreplay and arousal not all women will bleed their first time and I ideally there would be a lot of that to kind of help ease her into it the more comfortable and relaxed a woman can be the less likely that there will be any tearing and so it's kind of actually kind of sad I think that that bleeding would be seen as a sign of of virginity when it's it's not it wouldn't just be a sign of virginity but also of a really um rough wedding night that did that doesn't have to be that way. And so, yeah, so there are still people today. I mean, th this is in the Bible and we should be well beyond this today, but there are people who still uh, uh, think this way and every woman's different. So even a virgin can also have a rough night and also not bleed. So I just wanted to put that out there for anyone that may not know. Right. My understanding is also that a woman can have her hymen uh, broken through prior non-sexual physical activity I've, I've heard that as well like uh like through horse riding even or something so um i'm i'm not sure on that but yeah, right it's and so indicator for sure so there's all these 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 buts these these caveats to that test right and so it's just like yeah there are all these exceptions but they want a rule in order to be able to i think govern the female populace yeah. and have a conclusive answer and especially here because now this isn't a newlywed couple right this is a couple they've been together for some period of time i don't know how long it could be long it could be short and the husband thinks the wife is cheating on him she's stepping out she's committing adultery but he doesn't have any witnesses so what happens then because it doesn't make any difference about the bedclothes anymore, right? They're irrelevant to this particular inquiry. So the ordeal of the bitter water, Numbers chapter five, I'm gonna read this really quick. Some of you may have heard of this before. Some of you may have actually practiced this before, but I don't think it's many. The Lord spake unto Moses, this is from God. Speak unto the children of Israel, say unto them, if any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, and a man lie with her carnally, and it be hid from the eyes of her husband, husband, and be kept close or secret. And she be defiled, and there be no witness against her, neither she be taken with the manner. She's not caught in flagrante delicto. In the spirit of jealousy come upon him. It's interesting, this idea of the spirit of jealousy. Okay, he's jealous of her. He thinks that she's stepping out. And she be defiled, or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him and he be jealous of his wife, and she be not defiled, because you could be jealous of her without a basis, or maybe it is actual. How do you know? Well, this is where the ordeal of the bitter water comes in. Then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest. Okay, so there's the first thing. You have to have the man who is in authority in the church, in the religion. All right? Unto the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her, the tenth part of an ephah of barley meal. So there's going to be an offering that's brought. The husband's bringing it. He shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon, for it is an offering of jealousy, an offering of memorial, bringing iniquity to remembrance. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord. Now, I think the Lord there, I mean, she's going to be set before the Lord. That's interesting, right? And that's probably open to interpretation. I don't know if she's going to be in front of the uh, the uh, the Ark of the Covenant because that would be in the Holy of Holies. So I'm not exactly sure what that means. The one thing I'm pretty sure it means is that God doesn't appear and she's brought into his presence. Okay, it's some substitute I for just God. Assume some place public um, and near a holy place. Yeah, probably the tabernacle, some part. And the priest shall take holy water 
in an earthen vessel. He doesn't say what it is that makes it holy. The priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel, and of the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle, so that's where it is, the priest shall take and put it into the water. That's it. You take mud or dirt, put it in the water, it gets a little muddy. And the priest shall set the woman before the Lord and uncover the woman's head and put the offering of memorial in her hands, which is the jealousy offering. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causeth the curse. And the priest shall charge her by an oath and say unto the woman, If no man have lain with thee, and if thou hast not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband, be thou free from this bitter water that causeth the curse. But if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, and if thou be defiled, and some man have lain with thee beside thine husband, then... Oh, sorry. I got the next one. Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. Then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing, and the priest shall say to the woman, The Lord make thee a curse and an oath among thy people, when the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot, which I think is a euphemism with the thigh, and thy belly to swell. And this water that causeth the curse shall go into thy bowels to make thy belly to swell and thy thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. And the priest shall write these curses in a book and he shall blot them out with the bitter water. And he shall cause the woman to drink the bitter water that causeth the curse. Remember, this is the holy water with the, the dirt in it from the tabernacle. And the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her and become bitter. Then the priest shall take the jealousy offering out of the woman's hand, that's the ephah, that's the barley, and shall wave the offering before the Lord and offer it upon the altar. And the priest shall take a handful of the offering, even the memorial thereof, and burn it upon the altar, and afterwards shall cause the woman to drink the water. you got to get God's attention first with the offering. And when he hath made her drink the water, then it shall come to pass that if she be defiled, and have done trespass against her husband, that the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her and become bitter, and her belly shall swell, and her thighs shall rot, and the woman shall be a curse among her people. And if the woman be not defiled, but be clean, then she shall be free and shall conceive seed. This is the law of jealousies. When a wife goeth aside to another instead of her husband and is defiled, or when the spirit of jealousy cometh upon him, and he be jealous over his wife and shall set the woman before the Lord and the priest shall execute upon her all this law. Then shall the man be guiltless from iniquity and this woman shall bear her iniquity. Yeah. I, I was telling you that this reminded me of like the Salem witch trials where the men in the community devised rules, the priest of the community, but it was certainly a male driven process. And the men decided what sort of test will put the woman to? And most of these tests were designed to either kill you, most likely, and if you didn't die, then you were a witch and you would be then killed in some other form. And so if, if a woman was said, like, we're going to tie a weight to your foot and throw you in the water, and if you don't drown, then we know you're a witch. Well, if you drown, you died. And if you don't drown, somehow the rope gets untangled and you get away. They're like, oh, there's no way you could have gotten away unless you're a witch. And so you have in the Old Testament these religious rituals meant to determine right from wrong, good from evil, who did the right thing, who did the wrong thing, when all we're really doing is setting someone up to have get lucky and not get sick eating dirty water or to get sick from eating dirty water and then to be believed to have had an affair. That we never really get to whether someone did or didn't do something Instead, we create a magic spell that's really based in the fact that we threw dirt in your water, you drank it, and maybe you get a, a food poisoning, maybe you don't, and we're sort of leaving it up to luck. And I just want to know one other thing, which is if we all lived in this time period and there were apologists in the church, they would be, no ifs, ands, or buts, they would be defending the rituals of the church. Fair Mormon in uh, 1000 BC would be defending this ritual. Yeah. And at bottom, I mean, it's not like the people out there in the desert, in the wilderness with a tabernacle or drinking, you know, bottled water, the water they're drinking is going to be much more uh, contaminated than water that we are used to drinking. In fact, if we drank it, we'd probably get cramps and have all sorts of problems, but they're inured to our, it. Our thigh would rot and our stomach would swell. 
Yeah, that would happen. We get a bad headache too. But just putting I a little dirt. So I, I just wanted. I so I had to step away again. Sorry. Yeah. I I hope okay. I'm, this will um, get better. But did we did we talk about the thigh rotting and and what that was a euphemism for? I left it to imagination, and I think okay. people understand. But did you want to go into I, that further? I do want to spell it out that. Uh, my understanding of this, and this has been my understanding of this passage for quite some time, is that this, this is basically instructions for an abortion. If if there is a baby that is the result of a, a woman cheating on her husband, this is supposed to cause this bitter water cause will cause the fetus to expel. That's what it's what it's talking about: her belly to swell and to rot, like. It, and and if the, if it's a natural child of the husband, um, I don't know. Maybe we'll have to get. Yeah. Well, no, no. You see that uh, that interpretation, Maven, makes sense out of verse twenty eight, which I had wondered about as I read it. And if the woman be not defiled, but be clean, then she shall be free and shall conceive seed. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like the idea. Well, I mean, if she's. Okay, so perhaps then she has become pregnant and the husband thinks it's with somebody else's baby. And I mean, it's the fact because I mean, in the earlier verses, it said that he has no witnesses, right? So, right. So, I, I would assume that maybe there's a suspicious pregnancy. Um, mm. But this is, I, I guess, for those who call themselves pro life or, you know, and, and try to use the Bible to. Uh, I mean, the Lord gives instructions here for how to induce an abortion for a a, a cheated, you know, I, I, what's the word? Um, yeah, for an affair. If if the uh, if the pregnancy is a result of an affair, this yeah. is, yeah. JC here says the bitter water implies herbs or drugs. Some hypothesize argot, which was also sort of hallucinogenic if i'm not mistaken but from the threshing floor a common and potentially toxic fungus yeah because they have to hypothesize that because it does say bitter water but it just talks about dirt right yeah so anyway uh the main point of this that i wanted to point out here and the reason i brought it up is because it's going to tie into this 1984 first presidency letter that bill found a while back and that actually is the centerpiece of this entire uh podcast and it's built around it bill built it around it uh has to do with the fact that when we're in a situation in a male dominated society that we have a, a question we can't answer, but we need, we feel that we need to answer it, right? Then we come to the point where we are relying on a magical right in order to tell us, for God to tell us through the right whether this woman has been faithful to her husband or has not been faithful to her husband. Yeah. And so from there, I want to jump into Mormonism. Sorry, and again, I, I just want to underline it. I also think it's it's not just about how do we answer something. It's it's about control. It's controlling women and controlling the sex and also controlling the pregnancies. You don't want a pregnancy that's not yours. That fetus you, you want to have expelled if it belongs to somebody else, you there's there's no love for that child at all you you only want what is yours and so and uh, underlying all of this are is, is the idea of women as objects which is still true today i think members of the church can see it and they understand that that's how things were in biblical times but they're really reticent to say that that that's how it is today um but it it is true just because you think it's it's the it's the madonna or the whore it's it's kind of the one or the other and but ultimately it's the same thing so you you either view women as sexual objects to be treated and used and thrown away and discarded or you're supposed to have your one special sexual object that is just for you and has never been used by anyone else and that's what the whole virginity tokens and everything as well is it's, it's this woman is supposed to be a brand new in the packaging for you and uh it's still it's still objectifying and so i know so many members of the church and i said this myself and i and i argue with people online all the time who like to try to say no we we respect women we we uphold women in the church we we 
you know, we view this chastity, this virtue as something that's good and ought to be protected, etc. It's it's not. It's really you're just trying to preserve the packaging for the person that's going to open it. That's all that that is. And it, yeah. it's a contributor to all of the same, you know, the problems that we have here. So and that we'll we'll be going into more. Yeah. And, and I think it probably goes without saying, but I should say it anyway, that the uh, the Old Testament has these tests for women, but they don't really have tests that go the other way. No. And, and I'll just quickly say for that. Men. Yeah. And I'll quickly say that if you want to know maybe how harsh it was for women in Old Testament times, maybe look in the modern day to some of these Islamic countries that are really harsh about adultery or like if the man commits adultery, there's a lesser penalty, but if the woman is even suspected, even if it's just a 14 year old girl, cause there's a lot of underage marriage, she's like immediately stoned and killed. And there are really harsh processes for working out the law without really being able to prove whether someone did something or not. And Mormonism picks up on it. Whoever the That's author of you in the United States and it's, it, I, I agree it may not be as bad as it is in some other areas, but with the reversal of um, of Roe versus Wade, it's, I mean, we do have young girls, children who are, are you know, raped and are, are screamed at, who, who, who are able to get an abortion. I mean, there was the really publicized one where I think it was an Ohio girl, 10 years old, had to flee, I think it was to Kansas, to get an abortion and that was also right before their state started to you know cinch up the um the access to that so she had to be taken across state lines to be able to do that and there have been stories again in the US where young girls who are getting an abortion will have to go through a gauntlet of screaming people um religious people calling them baby murderers and and this is this could be like a 12 year old 13 14 year old girl that's getting health care that she needs that she should not have to carry a baby this is happening in the u.s and so it's um it's there's a lot of rollback happening right now where things are, are happening that haven't happened in a while and really shouldn't be happening in a modern day in a modern age and a modern country but this is where it always ends up with with the control of, of wanting to control everything about a woman and her body um these horrific cases come up and there's been some in the news lately as well. So yeah, it's all the same route. Yeah. And so now we'll jump into Mormonism and I'll try to zip through some of these uh, Mormon historical documentation of things that got said in the past, because it certainly frames how we view things today. And, and I'll be the first one to say up front, I think Mormonism has gotten better. It just hasn't gotten good. And Moroni chapter nine, we all remember this scripture, notwithstanding this great abomination of the Lamanites, it doth exceed that of our people in Moriantum. For behold, many of the daughters of the Lamanites have they taken prisoners, and after depriving them of that which was most dear and precious above all things, which is chastity and virtue. The idea is that if the daughters of the Lamanites have been raped, the daughters of the Lamanites have they taken prisoners and after depriving them of what was most dear and precious above all, if, if you rape a woman, by Book of Mormon theology, if you rape a woman, you take away her chastity and you take away her virtue. And all of us in our heads go, that's absurd. You can't. And they are the most dear and precious thing she possesses. Yeah. You can't take away someone's chastity and virtue by raping them. And just for the record, the church agrees because here's what happened a few years ago. Women in the church petitioned the church to remove that scripture. They had that scripture as part of the personal progress workbooks under the value of virtue. And women petitioned the church and the church removed it. The very bottom there of that uh, newspaper uh, article from, from online, online paper, LDS church spokesman Eric Hawkins told our news partners at the Salt Lake Tribune that the reference to Moroni 9.9 is gone in the personal progress workbooks. The English version has been changed. The other languages will follow. But I want to note, the church does this sort of ambiguously. It does it so the, the young women never encounter the scripture. But what doesn't happen is that all of the membership of the church as a whole is not informed that Moroni 9.9 
whoever the author of that is, they had an unhealthy, incorrect view of sexuality, and that scripture should be abandoned, and we should all have some mark in our scriptures that notes that we should never take that scripture based on what it seems to be saying. But the church does this all the time where it changes things, makes some move to slowly get rid of something, but then also leaves it in other places and also never publicly speaks out against it. So we're, so most of the Mormon membership is still left seeing value in the scripture, even though all of our common sense says it's absurd. You know and where the last... Oh, I'm sorry, Maven. And to, to victims of assaults, this will hit hard. I, people like to say just just because the church may say somewhere else that it's fine and that you're okay and this isn't your fault, the fact that this stuff still exists, this stuff is still, this, and especially in scripture, it's more authoritative to someone who's really wondering, am I okay or not? Did I, did I do something? Is there something evil about me that caused this to happen or allowed the Lord to let it happen or, or whatever? where the scripture would take precedence over what a leader would say. And this, this is something that's heavy and it hurts and it can't just be erased with it. Let with a just kidding or a never mind. Yeah. That's the problem. When you take a Victorian attitude toward women's sexuality and you canonize it. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's what we have here, by the way, you know, where the last time it was that I heard that scripture read where in the movie, the oath. Moroni reads it to the Lamanite girl Bathsheba. I mean, woman. Yeah, see, that's that's the problem the church has. Until it is bold enough to say, hey, whoever the author of Moroni 9-9 is, they messed up. They were incorrect about their own, what they thought was true, what they thought was true theology. It isn't. And we're going to remove it, or we're going to make a big mark uh, in the footnotes that clearly articulates that this is not the position the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints holds, but that's not what Mormonism does. It never wants to be seen as throwing uh, its authoritative voices under the bus unless it has to. And now I want to note, I want to speak for a moment about the miracle of forgiveness. Spencer W. Kimball is the author of it. He says lots of unhealthy things in it. The church in the modern moment, if you're if you ask the church about the miracle of forgiveness, they will tell you it's not authoritative. It it it's just the prophet happening happening to speak as a man. Uh, we don't need to take the personal writings of leaders and uh, and and wrap our arms around them as a prophet speaking as a prophet, but only when a prophet is acting as such. And the church does that, but it's a game they play because if you go back to the 1978, revised 1979, Gospel Principles Manual. This is the manual that all of the investigator classes use to teach the basic gospel principles uh, in, in developed uh, areas. Uh, and I just want to note here some of the teachings that are in this. And so you may have to make this full screen, folks, if you want to see it really well. Uh, under the Law of Chastity, page 238, right-hand side till page 239, Chastity is so important that President Kimball counseled young people to fight if necessary to protect it. Then down below, remember this, girls, it is actually better for you to die fighting for your chastity and cleanliness. See, again, he's indicating that rape will cause you to lose your chastity and you will be unclean. Then to let anyone take advantage. By the way, also but, notice they say only girls. It's better to die. Yeah. Life is not worth living anymore to you as a woman. You're done. If you come under the radar of the wrong person, this is it. This is what your life culminates to. A, a violent assault. Yeah. That, that you should die of instead of actually survive. And it's like there's, there's no other meaning left in life. And I I truly felt this way as a teenager. I was still reading this stuff. I I was terrified of rape more than anything else. And it's just really awful. Yeah. Hey, Bill, can I just mention here that this is another way that the church is run by men trying to figure out if women 
are responsible in any degree. And basically what they're adopting was a, a widely held sentiment from past ages that if a woman doesn't die fighting against her attacker, then she to some degree is responsible. Yeah, and you're gonna see that play out numerous times here in the next few slides. So remember this girls, again, girls only, boys couldn't possibly be raped. Uh, remember this, girls, it's actually better for you to die fighting for your chastity and cleanliness. So if you're raped, you're unchaste, and you are unclean, than to let anyone take advantage of you and take your virtue. So that your virtue's gone. If you have a boyfriend who insists upon using your body, fondling it with his hands, or otherwise, you tell him no, in no uncertain terms. And if he insists, then you may have to defend yourself. Remember that one of the prophets said that to retain, and I got to get out of full screen here, to retain, and I'm going to maximize it again, chastity is more important than your life. And they quote there a general conference. And then it says, and this is from the Miracle of Forgiveness. Again, this book was authoritative. This book was, RFM and I were talking about this. This book was given out by bishops when people had sinned and they had gone through a disciplinary court. Read the Miracle of Forgiveness. That's part of your repentance process. The church, on some level, the bishops felt encouraged to utilize the miracle of forgiveness all the time. And I don't have a data point that says the church gave that instruction, but it seems like the most rational, logical answer is that the reason all the leaders at the local level were using this book is because those above them told them to use it. And it's quoted in the curriculum. This book was authoritative. Even here's what it says. Even if we are under the threat of rape, President Kimball has said, quote, it is better to die in defending one's virtue than to live having lost it without a struggle. Miracle of Forgiveness, page 196. Women who are forcibly raped are under no condemnation from the Lord. I don't understand the difference. How, how is a woman who is forcibly raped under no condemnation, but if you're under the threat of rape, it's better to die in defending one's virtue than to live having lost it. See, you put this imaginary, arbitrary construct line, and you make the woman responsible for deciding where that line is, and the line isn't real to begin with. Every woman, rather than having to think about what her priesthood authority has taught her, should be free to go with whatever her intuition says in that moment is the best choice for her to make it through that situation she should feel no pressure from priesthood authorities about how she decides whether she fights and to what extreme she does. That makes no sense. I want to add to that. There are, I mean, we, we've heard of the light or uh, what is it? Fight or flight response. There's also freeze and there's also fawn. And for a lot of it not just women, women, children, men, anyone who finds themselves in a situation with with non-consensual any kind of action or touching at all, freeze is usually the first response. It's almost like a shock response. Like, what is this? Especially for children, they don't even know what's happening, and so freeze is is the typical response. But also just the shock of trying to understand what what is happening and is you know is this person that I know that I trust doing this thing and. I also want to point out the the way that they talk about sexual assault is is the way that fewer assaults actually happen, which is that the stranger comes and attacks you in your home or or out on the street or something where there's there's this you know a a, a specific inciting you know event and a violent you know rar this guy jumps out at you and you're defending you're fighting your life it's like being mugged. Um, Whereas the majority and they they acknowledge it sort of, but then like it's like you were pointing out, Bill, like the it's they're talking out of both sides of their mouth the whole time with all of these things with things that just don't make sense. When the majority of the time it could be somebody um either that you love or that you trust, either an authority figure or a member of the family, or it could be your your bo you know, your boyfriend, your beau, the, this guy that you've got a crush on, and he's just pushing things further than you're comfortable with. And so you're not going to you're not going to attack this guy and start screaming your head off. You know, it's just it's just not practical at all to think that the only 
two modes a woman can be in is is just totally willing or just like batshit trying to get out of the situation no matter what. And I mean, honestly, fighting back often can escalate the situation and make it more dangerous for a woman. So I've I've took rape aggression defense classes in college. I when I when I went to school, there's a class offered. So um um I took that as a freshman just because I felt like I wanted to feel at least feel like I could be more protected because I am a small woman and I also have lung issues. So I know like in any kind of a fight I wouldn't last long. And honestly for a majority of my life I've just felt like I just escape by on luck because if if a man wanted to force himself on me there's just really not a lot I can do it there's just really not a lot I can do at the end of the day but um but I what I learned from these rape progression defense classes they were called rad um for short which is just interesting but um being compliant often is a survival strategy not not if you're going to go somewhere you know, you definitely don't, like don't want to get in a car with someone. You don't ever want to be isolated. You don't want to ever be taken alone because then there's a really, really good chance that you will die. But if if that's not the case, if you're if it's somebody you know, if it's in your your own apartment or something like that, being compliant is the better way to get out with less injury to yourself and the, a lower chance of death. So by by having this be the expectation that that you have to fight first of all if you if you freeze and you're not able to fight the intense amount of guilt that that will add onto the victim on top of you know cuz it's it's not till later that like why didn't i do that i should have this i should have that but like your body you're not always in control of your body in these kinds of situations so so that's one horrible thing but then even if you do have the ability to fight back and and that is maybe what your re reaction could be you increase your chance of getting harmed you know seriously or severely injured or murdered by going the full 100 percent all the way route yeah and you Which mentioned this earlier. yeah you mentioned this earlier maven our heavenly father wants us to keep our bodies covered so that we do not put improper thoughts into the minds of others right you how you dress is is also a direct correlation to the thoughts that Satan puts into the minds of other people who see you scantily clad, who see you dressing immodestly, who see your porn shoulders. And so you wonder why Mormons get this sort of funny meme about always joking about porn shoulders, because we were constantly taught that how we showed up in the world made us responsible for how other people thought and behaved. Um, and then you've got breaking on the right-hand side, page 241, breaking the law of chastity is extremely serious. Unchastity is next to murder in seriousness. Alma 39, 5, right? We we know that this is a teaching in Mormonism that having sex with somebody not that you're not married to. By the way, you lose your chastity being raped. So in this case, being raped also leads to you having lost your chastity, which also then has the woman wondering if she's committed sin when you hear all these old stories of. Uh, folks going in to see their bishop and thinking because they were victimized, they have sinned. And the bishop having permission in this manual to sort of go like, well, you sort of have. Um, in seriousness. So unchastity is next to murder in seriousness. In reality, again, take the Bible out, take your idea of what God is out of the picture. In no way is having sex with someone next to murder. That, that's just ridiculous. President David O. McKay pleaded, your virtue is worth more than your life. Preserve your virtue even if you lose your lives. Again, quoted again, Miracle of Forgiveness, page 63. President Heber J. Grant, there is no true Latter-day Saint who would not rather bury a son or a daughter than to have him or her lose his or her virtue, realizing that virtue is of more value than anything else in the world. Gospel Standards, page 55. If you are a believing, faithful Mormon, you absolutely must believe that it is better for your son or daughter to come home in a casket than having lost their virtue. That is absurd. Take religion out for a moment and just use your common sense, use your gut, use, use the, the wisdom that's inside you and go, does that really make any sense? Do you really want your kid to come home in a casket rather than made some mistake that an 18, 19, 21-year-old kid is prone to make? That, that makes no sense at all. If a child is conceived by those who break the law of chastity, they may be tempted to commit another 
abominable. And I'll go to the next page here. It's going to talk about abortion. And let me make that big again. Another abominable sin, abortion. There is no excuse for abortion unless the life of the mother is seriously threatened. Um, what if you're raped by your dad? What if, like, you could sit here and name a hundred situations that don't fall into that one category, and I'm still not okay with it, even if you put those kinds of stipulations on it. But just to note that the church is immediately wrong on that perspective. Um, if you're raped by your dad and your life isn't in danger by giving birth to the baby, the church is saying, go ahead and have it. You should have no power without feeling shame to say that you want to get an abortion. Um, I want to say that every pregnancy is dangerous to women and can end a woman's life. So, and, and that's something that I know personally from my own family, my own extended family. And, um, you know, this is, as she was 23 years old and it was her first pregnancy married in the temple. So we're, we're talking about someone who's doing everything the right way, the way that we're taught to, to do things as Mormons. Um, she had her phone with her and she didn't dial 911. Um, so the, the complication that killed her killed her so quickly that she didn't even have a chance to try to call for help for herself. Yeah. Um, I want to read this next one to you too. And I want, I want to ask you guys the question, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, what might people reasonably take from this paragraph? It is extremely important to our Heavenly Father that his children obey the law of chastity. Members of the church who break this law may be excommunicated, and he gives the scriptural references. All those who do not repent after committing adultery will not be able to live with our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, but will live in the celestial kingdom. What might people reasonably take from that? Any thoughts you guys have? Well, to me, first off, the threat there sounds very similar to the threat about having your 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 thigh uh, sw swollen or rot. Yeah, you know, it's this it's this huge threat, and I almost think that part of the the attempted success of that is to threaten such a a horrible situation that you're going to compel a confession maybe even a false confession, I don't know. But I think that's probably what's gonna happen because I don't think it's really gonna happen if you just put some you know, dirt and water and drink it. I doubt that that's gonna happen. I think that the, the curse is so horrible that it's trying to compel the confession. And I sort of see this going on here. If you don't confess to us your adultery, then you will be punished forever by God because this is very important to Heavenly Father. Yeah, you. if you don't repent of this, and again, we, we you know we were talking about these stories where, you know, they they had premarital sex. They're trying to repent to go to the temple, but they both get killed before they could. And somebody says at the funeral that you know something like they we knew that was going on. And they'll never be with God again. And I've been part of conversations where unhealthy perspectives by members in the church spoke up at the rudest moments and said, "Well, that person's not going to get to heaven. The the rest of you better repent." Um, the threat of not living with your loved ones again, of not getting back to heavenly father of not, it's such a, again, I know that as a believer, you believe that's true, but it's such a heavy handed way to manipulate people into the behaviors you want them to have is to just scare the hell out of them and shave and shame them. Um, I, I noticed this last one here at the bottom. For many, confession is the most difficult part. We must not only confess to the Lord, but also to the person we have offended. And I, I saw this, not related to sexual abuse, but I saw this and I go, is that what the church leaders did when they got caught red-handed with the SEC agreement? Is that what Elder Oaks did when he was asked about electroshock therapy happening at BYU? Hmm. It, like This isn't how leaders in the church operate. They've had the second anointing. They're above this. They write rules that they don't keep, and I find that to be uh, quite telling as well. Um, let me skip here to the next one. Um, it says, we can hardly be too forceful in reminding people that they cannot sin and be forgiven and then sin again and again and expect forgiveness. And yet, from a scientific standpoint, our brain has inclinations. 
And even with behaviors that are unhealthy, it's sometimes because of patterns and habits and because of the way our brain works, we, even as we're really in our head, trying to be really good at something and to get rid of bad behaviors, we can't help but do the bad behavior over again and again and again. And here you have the church saying, well, if that's, if that's how things work for you, you're not going to get forgiveness on the fourth time you do this. And that also seems like a really unhealthy way when you understand human psychology and how the human brain works to tell people that if they do a bad behavior more than once, they can attain forgiveness. Um, and then we'll jump in. So that's the miracle or, uh, sorry, that's the gospel principles book, which quoted miracle of forgiveness that we're told isn't authoritative, but somehow it was in the curriculum. It was so authoritative, Bill. It was super authoritative. There was no book more authoritative in the seventies and the eighties than the miracle of forgiveness. It was handed out by authorities, i.e. bishops, state presidents, like they were candy and people were told to read them. There was no other book like this, not even Mormon doctrine. Mormon doctrine wasn't being handed out by bishops and told to read, uh, Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, Discourses of Brigham Young. No, this one was. So this had its own unique kind of authority. Yeah. I was going to ask, was was this part of the Missionary Library? Yes. At one time? And that's why I go to those books. It was one of the 10 volumes in the Missionary Library back when they had 10, back when missionaries were smarter and they could handle more books in their library. But this was the one, right? This was the one, the miracle of forgiveness that you were supposed to read and all the youth were supposed to read. And if you didn't have a copy, the bishop had a stack of them in his closet. Yeah. And I I remember when I came into the church, the miracle of forgiveness was still fairly prevalent then in my bishop's office, in my stake president's office uh, back in the late 90s. And so Mm -hmm. uh, certainly everyone... uh, at a, at a certain for a certain period in the church, every local leadership was using that book in the repentance process, and it was forming forming their opinions, their perspectives about how homosexuality is caused, about how serious each of these sins are. And um, we just have to wrap our heads around that when you get fifteen old white guys together, you're probably not going to get the healthiest code uh, when you get a bunch of old guys together from being born decades and decades and decades earlier in the perspective that they come to believing that the old Testament is historical, legitimate, real stuff. Um, and so here we're going to move into this letter that sort of was the centerpiece. Wait, of- I, I wanted to talk about this quote before we move in. Well, I guess this is part of the letter, is it not? This is part of the letter. You yes. Read it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, we haven't read the letter yet. So this is just a, a little meme from Mist in Sunday School, but you can sort of see causing her to submit without making a real show of resistance. So 1979, the Gospel Principles Manual is quoting Miracle of Forgiveness in telling women that they have to die if needed to thwart off rape or else they will lose their chastity, they will be unclean, and they will lose their virtue. And in 1984, the church sort of revisits this and is trying to kind of get rid of it. But remember, Spencer W. Kimball, who's part of the First Presidency as a, at the time when this letter is issued, there's the letter as a whole. We'll zoom in here in a moment. There's the letter. The very guy's signature at the top there in the First Presidency is the very guy who five years earlier has his quotes put into Gospel Principles Manual. And it's teaching that women have to give up their life in order to keep chastity and virtue and to be clean. So when we get into the letter, uh, and again, I'm going to make this full screen. Uh, June 4th, 1984. Dear brethren, and I'm, I'm only chuckling here because in that first line, RFM, if you remember, there's a they should have worded this better. Uh, the very first line, dear brethren, for the for the information of members who may inquire about the subject, there follows a statement on rape, which has our approval. Now, it's not that it's not that rape has their approval. Right. But it's syntactically it, infelicitous. Yeah. But it make if you don't know where to pause and take your breath in that long sentence, it's not quite 39 characters, 39 words in that sentence. We don't know if it's a true sentence, but uh, that's a play on Brian Hales, by the way. So for the information of members who may inquire about the subject. There follows a statement on rape, 
And the statement that follows has our approval. That's what they're saying. Easy fix. Yeah, they should have done a little better. Somebody should have read that and thought that through. The degree of resistance necessary to prevent a rape will, of course, vary with the circumstance. So they first they start off by validating that some degree of resistance is necessary for every degree of rape. Um, but of course, that will vary depending on what kind of rape is happening. To prevent it. Yes. One attacker may be deterred by mere words of pleading or ridicule. I'm going to also say you probably shouldn't put the thought in a woman's head that she should go to ridiculing the rapist. Because I also think in some situations. Yeah, I have something to say to about that. that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I was going to wait till the end of the letter, but I, the, I hate everything about the way that this is worded. So, um, yeah, I and and you guys know because I was I was texting you guys about this kind of stuff, but I I don't remember I which comedian said it and it might have been more than one that said men when it comes to dating men worry about women laughing at them, women worry about men murdering them, and that's really really true. Men can be really dangerous, and we don't know who you know people can look good or not so every every time we're putting ourselves out there you never know and this was something that was just also terrifying to me sometimes that you can never have just a really truly unless you're really really naive and innocuous like meet cute at a club or i mean not even not a club because i was a good mormon girl but it just even at your ward or something and not sometimes wonder if the guy whose attention you caught and you had a good conversation with might be completely unhinged and i i had someone like i had i gave a talk in a ward in my byu hawaii ward and a member of the ward that i didn't even know just started to have a crush on me from there and he eventually asked me out but i had no clue who he was but at this point he'd already been kind of obsessing over me over a while and so we went on one date it was fine because of course you say i you always say yes um and so i i didn't know anything about him but i went on a date um and that was kind of it for me. But on Valentine's, which was like coming up, he went full out with like the chocolates and the flowers and stuff. And then I was telling him like, you know what? I'm a senior now. I'm graduating. And he had just started. Um, he was still in like the TESOL classes, the English as a second language classes. So he had a long way to go before he was, you know. And so it, it, he I, just from one day and I think one other kind of hangout, um, he was you know, when I pointed out, I just, and I'm glad I did because I, I think if I was more naive, I would have thought that surely he understands I'm graduating, I'm moving, I'm getting a job or something like, unless something really, really magical happens right this second, but something already magical was happening for this guy. And so he was like, well, can we talk? Can we Skype and things like that? And I said, yeah, but I, again, I was still naive a little bit. I, you know, I, I thought he just wanted to keep in contact. But no, he was. He started getting angry if I wasn't answering or if I didn't commit to a Skype time. And he started to be like, I mean, it was over text and I was far away, so it wasn't really that threatening. But he was starting to be abusive with me. And at one point, I I I spelled it out for him because I realized where this was going. And I said, I said, we are, are not a couple. We are not boyfriend and girlfriend. We I I barely even know you. And this isn't this isn't going anywhere for me. And he literally threatened to kill himself. And he pulled out lines like, you know, God told me, you know, to love you and all this, all of this stuff. Like it just, and that all of that happened because I gave a talk in church and this guy liked me just from that talk. So you really don't know anyway. So that was a whole like side thing, but, but it's the ridicule. A, a man's ego, like, ruining it's it's the ego that puts a woman in danger the absolute most and this is still true in mormonism maybe i like i even the, the quote unquote nice mormon guys and i and i can sympathize that it's not easy to be rejected i have also been rejected but i have never treated men when i've been rejected the way that i've been treated i i've been like by good Mormon boys who were doing all the stops that seemed gentlemanly at, at first and completely all in line when I said, as soon as I said something that 
made it clear that this is a boundary or I'm not girlfriend material or this isn't going to progress for me. Uh, like literally being called a bitch by active attending and, and just feeling this, this entitlement that I led them on, that I was too nice. If I wasn't interested is there's just, even the nice guys aren't so nice with this. And so anytime, like this is what I, I was starting to say when I was saying earlier that there's no such thing for a woman as a really innocuous kind of a meet cute where maybe you just meet somebody at the, at the school lunch cafe or something like that. Um, you know, just having a guy like me, knowing, just seeing those feelings already put me in a, a, a place of danger. And that still happens. If a guy is expressing interest in me that I think might be romantic, I start having anxiety because I don't always know what he's going to be like when I say no. And I say no most of the time. So um, anyway, and that happened even like recently with a, a close friend that I, I would have thought would have been beyond that. So Anyway, so sorry, I keep I, I have so many experiences with this. I really did want to try to try to keep it in. But um, ridiculing a man is a great way to get murdered. I'm not saying obviously that we deserve that. I feel like that we had some weird people in the chat that might like imply that. But ridiculing uh, a man during a rape will probably yeah. end up with you having more violence extended towards you. Right. I mean, and even like not during like, just a social like, interaction, yeah. if I'm alone with a man and I'm not, and there's any kind of a, a like tension at all, I, I am going to be extremely pleasant. I, I have a lifetime of learning how to deescalate and be pleasant and cater to men. And that's, and that, honestly, that is the best survival strategy. So, so the idea, just the idea of this letter that, that that, it's even a, an appropriate response. It just goes to show I just how male centric that is. Cause that maybe that's what you would do. You could make fun of somebody, you, you know, males, you could do that with each other and, mm -hmm. and have a little rough up, you know, but it's, I don't know. It's just, it's just really, really obtuse. Um, and, and to even to suggest or, or like think that that might be a way a strategy at all and uh, this reminds me actually of it there was a in in young women's and this was kind of given as a joke of something to like tell to a guy if he's getting a little too handsy you know is is this my body is the temple and you don't have to recommend and it's funny and it's pity but like that's there's no situation where that line could be used in a way that would actually be helpful for anyone that needs it ever right ever right. I just want to, I want to note miracle or forgiveness and the gospel principles book is being used every Sunday to some degree, somewhere in that ward building, somebody's having a conversation, having a, that teaching being seen as authoritative. Those unhealthy teachings we just went over are very public. There's no doubt in my mind this letter is a reaction by the top leading brethren, including the guy whose quotes are in that book, as a pushback against that manual in the unhealthy consequences and permutations that are coming from it. They seem to be speaking directly to that gospel principles chapter and sort of going like, I know we said it, but not exactly. And, and I remember the same thing happening with the oral sex, but here's my point. Anytime I am unhealthy and I harm another person in public, I am responsible to apologize in public in the same sort of venue that I started the abuse. That I, if I, if I ridiculed somebody and they were offended, if I, um, if I did something that was inconsiderate, my responsibility is to help that person move through that hurt by doing it in the same degree of public setting as I did the abuse. And when the church writes letters to the local leaders, but the teaching they're trying to disavow or get away from is in the Sunday manual, the degree to which that unhealthy theology will perpetuate and permutate years into the future, the church knows it's not going to stop that teaching. They are comfortable protecting themselves from being challenged by saying they sent a letter out, but the letter will never have the same influence that the lesson manual in the book have. And the church does this on occasion after occasion after occasion where their disavowal 
is much more subtle than the thing they were doing that they've walked away from. And so I just want to note that. And that continue to be said in general conference, even after this letter. Yeah. By the way, yes. know that we stopped with ridicule and I thought that everything that Maven said on that was really important. Yes. I think that when you get to the following sentence, even though that's not the, the end of that sentence, I think the following sentence actually sets forth the reason yeah. that they're writing this letter. And I do note this is 1984. Yeah. President Kim dies the next year. Yeah. yeah. Gordon B. Hinckley is the one responsible for this. Yeah. So one attacker may be deterred by mere words of pleading or ridicule, while another may be so determined and violent that nothing short of death would deter him. We would be reluctant, therefore, to define precisely the form or degree of resistance which a man should make to a threat, um, which a woman should make to a threatened rape. And I just want to note that's in complete disagreement with the gospel principles book, which told you that you should lose your life if being raped. Yes. And this is the reason they're writing this letter, but it should be in general conference, not in a letter just to the bishops. Yeah. And, and that's what we're setting up here is they're trying to correct old teachings, but they're so bad on it on purpose. They're so bad at correcting old teachings that even prophet seers and revelators in the future don't know about the letter but know about the, go the gospel principles and miracle of forgiveness, and they repeat the thing that was said in the past. Um, this, this letter came out two years before I was born, and yet when I was still a teenager, my own mother taught me to to fight with everything that I had yeah. if something like that happened. Yeah. Everything that I had. Yeah. So yeah. I intuit that Gordon B. Hinckley is the one behind this, and he's trying to get this to the bishop so they understand, no, that's not the way it is. You don't just say if they come out of it alive, then they didn't fight enough. We're not going to define this. And you're saying that because at this point in 1984, Spencer W. Kimball is, for all effects, uh, incapacitated. And yes. Marion G. Romney, for all effects, is incapacitated. Yes. Hinckley is running the first presidency. He can't exactly disavow President Kimball's teachings. So it has to be put out in a softer way, this letter. And it has to be carefully worded in a way as to not exactly disavow everything President Kimball had said on the topic. It says it is um, it is conceivable that a woman would be so terrified uh, by mere threats of violence made by an attacker that her sense of agency would be overpowered, causing her to submit without making a real show of resistance. On this account, it would be difficult, even presumptuous, for another to judge the moral guilt or culpability of a person attacked. That sounds halfway decent, not perfect. There's still problems with that sentence, but halfway decent. But then they finish it up with a comma and say, unless, of course, a confirmation comes through the spirit that she is guilty or culpable, which then puts the onus right back on the priesthood authority who speaks to God, who is the representative of Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father to the congregation. He knows that he's inspired. And so he now has the right to discern whether the woman is still culpable or not. There's the ordeal of bitter water. Yep. There's the magic. And if you've got a bishop, and these are all guys, right? And it's usually going to be a bishop over a woman making a judgment as opposed to a stake president. But these are older men generally who were raised to understand that unless a woman dies, if she comes out of it alive, she has not done enough. She is in some sense responsible. That's their background. And it's a very, very easy thing, believe me, to have your preconditioning be thought to be the spirit whispering in your ear that she is responsible to some degree and think that's the Holy Ghost when actually it's your preconditioning. You you make a great point, RFM. When you said the Salem, when I said the Salem witch trials, I was reminded of those by your Old Testament scriptures you shared. A modern day bishop trusting the thoughts in his head and the feelings in his gut about whether a woman is guilty or not of having fought enough during a sexual assault is no, it's it's no less accurate. It's no more statistically sure way to be certain than it is to drink dirty water and if if the repercussions are one way or the other and you know they're innocent or they're guilty, 
you're still giving people permission to decide truth based on something that is completely foreign to the person making the decision. I know of women who have been told by priesthood leadership after, after making an, an accusation against a man that they prayed about it and that they've sided with the man and that they're not telling the truth. And I can't imagine what that must be like to, to have gone through it, to then go to a bishop that you trust, tell them what happened, and then have them come and look you in the eye and say, I prayed about it, and the Spirit told me, you are lying. Yeah. yeah. Also notice lots of letters from church leadership. The instruction at the top is to read the letter in sacrament meeting. This letter does not have that instruction, I don't think. Yeah. It just and says... I want to go over this sentence too. If we go back, because this is a long sentence and there's all kinds of problems. I, I kind of want to go back to the beginning of it, to the, the, it is conceivable that a woman could be so terrified. And, and I just, the wording of this is almost it kind of bringing me back to Nelson's plain, you know, uh, death flight where the, you know, the hysterical women, it, it almost, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I'm, I'm, I'm almost kind of seeing this kind of energy, this like, oh, this, this frail, fragile, weak woman, like, like physically, yeah, this is a genuine threat to us that we cannot always like, you literally do not have the strength to overcome. But I, this wording here seems to make it more psychological rather than a, an actual physical reality. It's conceivable that a woman could be so terrified by mere threats of violence mere threats of violence made by an attacker that that her sense of agency would be overpowered it's like yeah mere i just i it boggles my mind that this word is there mere threats of power like they that those shouldn't be taken seriously they should and in fact a, a lot of women who do end up dead from spousal or domestic partner abuse it it's because of the warning signs that that weren't taken seriously or threats that weren't taken seriously you know it's just i i don't know it just seems so dismissive to me i mean it's trying to be helpful so i i see that i just i just don't know if they could make it any worse yeah. in, in trying to be helpful but also make it sound like well you know women are kind of hysterical and and she might, you know, a, a guy might say some words and threaten her and she might just, you know, believe that, that, that you know, there's no point in fighting or something, which Doesn't, is a really flippant, like, disregard for the reality that women face, that physical, like, visceral, violent reality. Doesn't it seem like the sentence should say something like, it's almost certain that a woman would be absolutely terrified by mere threats of violence made by an attacker that her sense of agency would be overpowered. Like that seems more like the truth, right? Uh, right. Uh, See, and, and men who are going to hurt you are, don't always announce it. So like I said, if, if I just get a, an inkling that a, a man is starting to like me, like if it's a coworker or something, I, that enough isn't to start the initial little bit of anxiety of just wondering, like, is this going to be a problem? if things don't go their way because just because of the escalation factor. So it's just, yeah. I can't, if, if a man is acting threatening, if he's in my space, if he's not backing up, if I'm alone, if there's like all of these factors in play, he doesn't have to tell me what he's going to do. So the fact that it, I, I guess that a threat of violence, that if a man is actually telling me like that he is going to hurt me, like I'm already on like, 10 star alarm like radar like i would i would already be in fear of my life well before a threat would have to be made just based on a, a guy's behavior and the situation i'm in so i just ah it just kills me mere yeah. threat mere threats of violence under these circumstances we feel that the safe course is for leaders of the church to urge sisters who are threatened with rape to resist to the maximum extent possible or necessary under the circumstances. Under these circumstances, we feel that, I'm, I'm reading it again, folks, for those who are listening to the audio. Under these circumstances, we feel that the safe course is for leaders of the church to urge sisters who are threatened with rape. By the way, no one knows when they're going to be raped. So you have to give people this instruction beforehand. 
And by the way, I was trying to make the note that most letters ask you to read it uh, uh, from the pulpit to the congregation. This one says, for the information of members who may inquire. So, so Kimball taught a bunch of bullshit. The Gospel Principles Manual perpetuated it. Heber J. Grant said some things that were unhealthy. But only if a member asks you about that do we correct you with the healthy teaching, and only then. You can see how the church wants to take credit for getting rid of things, but doesn't really want to get rid of things. Okay, so they the safe course is for leaders of the church to urge sisters who are threatened with rape to resist to the maximum extent possible or necessary under the circumstances, leaving it to their own conscience and good judgment as to the degree of such resistance. Furthermore, because of a lack of knowledge of the circumstances involved, which only the parties to the rape would know, we should not presume to judge a woman who has been raped, leaving judgment to the omniscience of the Lord, except if we go back to the first big paragraph, sorry, the second big paragraph, for another to judge the moral guilt of culpability of a person attacked, unless, of course, a confirmation comes through the spirit that she is guilty or culpable, they're contradicting themselves. They're not even teaching in the same letter a consistent theology. On one hand, they're saying, Bishop, if the Spirit tells you they're they're guilty of not putting enough, up enough resistance and they've broken the law of chastity, you are free to exercise your priesthood authority in judging that woman. And then in the bottom, it says that, that they should not presume to judge a woman who has been raped, leaving the judgment to the omniscience of the Lord. This letter is a tightrope walk of Gordon B. Hinckley trying not to throw Spencer W. Kimball under the bus, but having so many complaints coming up about priesthood leaders having an unhealthy perspective about how much resistance a woman should put up to sexual violence that they're trying to correct it without actually correcting it. They have no clue. Yeah. Oh. No clue at all. And RFM. What was that, RFM? I said, <laughs> well, they don't. We're guys. Yeah. I'm sorry, we have no clue. We honestly don't. And that's why I insisted that, you know, you be on the show in spite of your your ill health. And thankfully, you, you're here because your voice is so important and the clarity you bring. But if you look at that letter, the most telling things about it to me are the opening and the closing. Dear brethren, let's talk about women and how they should be judged when they're raped. Sincerely, <laughs> your brethren. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is insane. Um, and so now here's what happens when you put out a letter to try to fix a problem that is all throughout your curriculum and is used in almost every disciplinary court. The letter doesn't do it good enough. And what you end up with then is only what, uh, seven, eight, seven, eight years later in 1992, uh, Richard G. Scott ends up perpetuating the teachings of 1979. He should know better. <clears throat> if you want to know if that letter is effective, this tells you that letter was ineffective at correcting the bullshit of the past. And so you have Richard G. Scott. At some point in time, however, the Lord may prompt a victim to recognize a degree of responsibility for abuse. Your priesthood leader will help, and this is my words, the victim assess your responsibility so that if needed, it can be addressed. And we actually have the audio from Richard G. Scott. And here it is. Adversity, even when caused willfully by others' unrestrained appetite, can be a source of growth when viewed from the perspective of eternal principle. The victim must do all in his or her power to stop the abuse. Most often, the victim is innocent because of being disabled by fear or the power or authority of the offender. At some point in time, however, the Lord may prompt a victim to recognize a degree of responsibility for abuse. Your priesthood leader will help you assess your responsibility so that if needed, it can be addressed. Otherwise, the seeds of guilt will remain and sprout into bitter fruit. Yet no matter what degree of responsibility, from absolutely none to increasing consent, the healing power of the atonement of Jesus Christ can provide a complete cure. Forgiveness can be obtained for all involved in abuse. 
I hear so much victim blaming there. Um, I'll just say to any victim out there of sexual assault, you're not at all to blame, regardless of how you dressed, regardless of what resistance you put up, regardless of which part of your lizard brain you went into, fight, flight, freeze, fawn. All of that is reasonable in trying to deal with the terrifying act of someone attempting to sexually assault you. My my problem with this uh, clip are legion, but one of the first things is that a victim in a situation like this is almost certainly, regardless of the circumstances, going to feel guilty or responsible to some degree. And sometimes it's to a huge degree. It's totally out of proportion. It's irrational. It just happens that, that, that there's that responsibility. There's that guilt. And what Richard G. Scott is now doing is he's ratifying, um, verifying, uh, I'm forgetting the, the word here, but um, uh, validating. He's validating those guilt feelings. He's not saying what you said, Bill, which is it's not your fault. That's what he should be saying. What he's saying is if you do feel guilty, which most of you are going to feel guilt about, even though it's not rational, now he's going to validate that by saying that's Heavenly Father making you feel guilty. So if you feel guilty about it, it is because you did something that you are responsible for in being abused and being raped. And now you can go to your priesthood leader who will help you figure out exactly how much you're responsible, which I'm sure goes along with the detailed recitation of the event to figure out how much you're responsible and what is you, you need to do in order to gain forgiveness. And finally, at the end of it, did you notice what he said? To help you and the abuser obtain forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And this is the same idea that child abusers, I'm sorry, I know it's more than just child abuse, but it's included within this, that child abusers can gain forgiveness and go on, and now they're clean and pure, and they don't have these, uh, I think this happens for uh, people who abuse adults as well, uh, not just children, that this is um, something that's it's built it's in. This. I'm Jesus sorry. Jesus is the victim. What? Say that again. It's it's the idea that Jesus is the real victim. You just got to say sorry to Jesus. So when when you when you hurt this kid or you hurt this person, you, the person you really got to apologize to and make things right with is Jesus. So and that's and that's kind of where like a, a lot of these conservative religions kind of all tie into each other. And that's the the abuser works it out with Jesus and not with the person that they hurt. And then it's that. I don't know. It just puts okay. them both almost like on the same side of the coin where they're both yes. malefactors and, and Jesus is the one that has to be repented to the abuser for doing the abuse and then the abusee for, you know, for forgiveness. And if they don't, then that's on them. Like that's their sin is, is not passing on the forgiveness. And before we go to the next section, Bill, I, I think, um, I, I think maybe this will be maybe my next part where I, I'll go into more of, of my things if, if that's okay. Cause I feel like it, it, the, the tone is a little bit different going in, going forward. Um, I just wanted to talk about like my experience. Uh, and I'm sorry, I, my, my brain is not as here as I would like it to be. Um, and I, I just had a thought and so I'm trying to pull it up now. Um, I, I was asked to babysit for a couple down the street that I've babysat for before. And they, I was surprised when I got there to find that there was an adult there. They were going out for a date night and they had two, two daughters, but the husband's sister was there. And so I never met her before. And so I was surprised that I would be called to babysit when she was also staying behind. And they didn't tell me why other than just that for the wife's peace of mind, she would prefer that there would be somebody else there at the house. And that's all that they told me. And the reason why I found out was because the, uh, the husband's sister had a, uh, an epilepsy kind of uh, condition and she was prone to seizures, very mild, not very often, unpredictable, of course. So there, 
didn't know it would happen. I think the husband probably would have been fine leaving her with the kids, but it was the wife that just wanted one more person there. Um, yeah, she did have a seizure while I was there. I had no clue that I, I, they didn't prep me at all. And I think maybe because they didn't want to say, maybe the wife didn't want to say in front of her sister-in-law that it was because of this condition that she wanted to have another person there. But still, like, what a position that put me into because I I had no idea. I wasn't familiar enough with seizures other than like from movies, like a grand mall kind of type seizure. This was a more mild one. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know if it was a medical emergency. I was frightened. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if I needed to save this lady's life. And 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 then also like with the kids, it, it was kind of a terrible situation to just kind of throw me into uh, unprepared and then just, you know, go off for the night. And I kind of feel like that's what was done to me as a teenager in regards to sexuality because in the for strength of the youth pamphlet um and i just just all growing up it was made very very clear to me that i'm not just a gatekeeper of my own chastity and virtue but also of the young men and and i took that seriously but i i just think about how naive i was and it's, especially just like with me being ace i just i and, and just not very sexual myself so there's a, a lot of things that just really flew by me I had no clue and no real tools to like save myself or help myself at all other than like the pity thing I said earlier where it's like my body's a temple and you don't have a recommend that that doesn't help anything and then I, I it just was you know this was Bill's show and his idea but as I was kind of rethinking things it, it just kind of settled on me what what a really dangerous and terrible situation all women are put into in the church because first of all not only are we all sexually repressed and shamed for any kind of feelings and any healthy way of exploring them either with peers consensually or with ourselves through masturbation it's all just suppressed 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 and then at a time where it's like boys are going through puberty like it's so heightened and so with the it's just it just heightens it like more and more and more it just makes it more likely and, and and harder for young men i would imagine to be trying to control this all the time and not have a, a healthy outlet and then just kind of foist that on the women and uh, girls children and just be like well this is your responsibility tell them no yeah, and you'll be great. It'll be fine, you know. And just and and then the adults are out of the room, and they just expect that to be enough in like peer to peer interactions. It's just it's no wonder so many awful things happen, and it's just really unfair and just really. I don't I don't know the words. It just seems so devious, almost like if I if there were a Satan. I think there's nothing more diabolical that this this would be a perfect plan for a sadistic person to come up with to do this to to suppress teens like at the height of their sexuality and then put all of the blame on women and and it's it, with the modesty especially and I have my own story with that but I don't know if you guys I I, I you wouldn't have seen maybe they sometimes recruit young men to help us ladies know what our bodies do to them. So I, I had peers come in for like a special young women to really sheepishly, awkwardly like hem and haw in front of young women and, and talk about modesty and how like you we're really pretty and it, it just helps them a lot if we're covered up like I know I'm not the only one. I know that there's going to be other people in the comments who will say like they have absolutely they've been in that young women lesson or they were the the poor boy asked to say those kinds of things in the young women lesson for that. So it's it really isn't they really are equally teaching men and I, I say men, boys and girls that that it's on us, that it's the girls issue. And so it's just it's just diabolical. It's really, really diabolical. I I'll go ahead and go in. I don't know if you had a, a thought I'll, and I'll go into like my, my red dress story. It just, I, I just, I was just really, it just really struck me. It just like how, if there was, it just seems so evil. It, it, it almost seems like intentional. Um, and I think actually I might have to share my screen for the video to work. Um, okay. 
yep, I'm getting the nod. And Bill, I think I see you trying to do it, but I think I I might get to it first. Yeah, go so ahead. I talk about this in my Mormon story interview. So this will be a, a clip from that. And I actually ended up finding after the fact a picture of the dress that I'm talking about. So that's on the side here. So let me share system audio. Okie dokes. I am there. Here we go. All right. Give me the thumbs up if uh, hopefully the sound is working. It was just always cheap stuff. I never um, like liked my clothing or was ever like, into fashion. It always just kind of stressed me out trends and things like that because I could never like keep up or fit in in that kind of a way. But there was one time, and again, this was from the thrift store. Um, uh, I think my mom had bought me this red dress and it was like pretty modest, but it was kind of borderline. So even at the time that I got it, I was kind of like, mm, I don't know. I mean, it'd be a form fitting dress, but not super tight or anything, but usually it kind of goes down to the knees. Um, and it was, you know, the collar was high. It had wide shoulders and it had sleeves, but like, I guess like here, like where the sleeve kind of ends uh, from this point all the way down, it was just lace. So it was something I knew like garments wouldn't go in, even though I'm obviously too young for that. But I know like, because they're like, some of it would show on the sleeve. So that was another thing that kind of made a borderline for me. And then just the fact that it went to my knees meant I had to like really be sure to sit ladylike, you know, so it just kind of, and I it was developing a figure and, it, and this was like the first thing that kind of showed that. Um, and so I liked it, but it just hung in my closet and, but my mom liked it too on me. And so like Sunday after Sunday, she would be like, why don't you wear that red dress? Finally, I caved one day and I wore it. And everything went fine. I did feel good in it. Is that it's like it was really the only dress I ever felt in that I I felt good in. But I got out early in Young Women that day or something. So I remember I was standing in the hallway and I'm I'm leaning against the wall. I heard one of the boys say, "Why do girls dress like that?" And mm. I knew I was the only person in the oh. hallway, like besides those guys. Yes. And then the other guy said, like they think it makes them look good, but it doesn't. Oh. Yeah, I'm I'm getting emotional now. It destroyed me at the time so how old like, are you again 14 or 15 mm. yeah but i thought they were right you know like these were like righteous boys and i thought it was a good lesson like this is this is a good lesson for me you know to not push the borders of course i kept saying borders but i meant boundaries and i saw kind of like a smirk from you bill as i i, I was explaining and describing the dress that was my it, fault. No, no, no. So our, that was my fault. Off the screen, and I thought I was going to follow his lead and go off the screen. But as soon as I did it, he put himself back on, and I'm like, "Oh, I'm just chasing. I'm just a dog oh. chasing his tail here at this point." Oh so. no worries. Okay, I thought I thought you were yeah. kind of laughing at my description of the dress because I was going off no. of memory. Then I hadn't actually come across this picture in a long time. So um, when I did, I and so I thought I was kind of laughing myself. So I thought you were kind of laughing at like how how modest this looks yeah right? this is, yeah this is like super modest not, anything yeah. i encountered as a person right. both growing up as a kid and as an adult I, I would look at this and go that is overly modest you're wearing leggings you like i just wouldn't the, the dress right. after your knees like for me this was like this was that temptation yeah. this was you know satan trying to get me over to the other side like a little step at um, a time kind of a thing with something that i wouldn't be able to wear garments with and you know i just like barely starting a figure. There's just, it's a V-neck. There's just the ever so slightest little dip there, you know? But I, again, I, I mean, I did have, and I kind of left that part in the beginning. I did not dress well. I had a lot of really cheap thrift shop, you know, misshaped, ill-shaping clothes that just did not flatter me very well. This is one of the first things that like actually kind of like, really fit me, just fit me. And I, I worried that it was too tight, you know, all, all of these things. So when, when I, finally found this and I came across it. it it was more modest than I had remembered in, in my mind I think I was like shortening the length of it and everything but I I do remember distinct and it was red too which also seemed kind of like a hussy color to me so like it was almost like if it had been green or something it might not have been as bad but since it's a, like a, a flagrant bright like attention grabbing color like even the color itself was not exactly modest to me besides the lace besides the v-neck and, you know, besides me needing to wear leggings or needing to like be sure I sit on the, the chairs properly. So, yeah, this this really was like 
over the line. And I just, it's just kind of sad to me now to look at it and just see like how innocuous it was. But, and it wasn't just me, but clearly, you know, these boys in the hallway also saw this as like over the line or as, as trying too hard and trying to get their attention. You know, it's just, it's just sad, I guess. I don't know what else I want to say besides that. No, I, I do have more to say besides that. But did, did you guys want to? jump in I, just that the amount of shame that children are made to feel in mormonism when you sit and go through all of it like this is just one facet tonight that we're talking about it is it's really sad and it's really sad that 15 old men aren't courageous enough and willing enough to be accountable as to stand up and start really doing the hard work of getting rid of and telling the the audience all the members of the church that the teachings that are behind us are wrong and that while we claimed men were prophets seers and revelators it seems like in a whole ton of moments they were anything but and of course it disproportionately affects women that that do have curves um and and that's also something that's not in our control some girls start developing really early and there's just nothing you can it's it's just it's our body it's who we are and and short of like huge baggy which i know girls that did that developing or like early developing girls were constantly wearing baggy things and slouched over and were trying to hide you know and it's it's just sad that and they would also get picked on more needing to wear a t-shirt you know over their swimsuit somewhere because they're you know, and, and again, even though there's modesty standards for swimsuits, right? There's like leaders could say something, male leaders, and and have a female leader tell a girl to put a t-shirt on over her. You know, it's just, yeah, it's it just doesn't make sense. Um, I feel like I had another thought that I I might have lost it. No, no, actually, no. I I I think I've got it back. I I do want to go. I mod for Mormon stories and there's a couple of shorts that have gotten a lot more comments than others. One is a guest um, and I'm forgetting her name now, um, but she talks about basically the kind of the licked cupcake lesson. And I eventually had to restrict the comments on that because I, I mean, all she was saying in it, you know, was it's talking about feeling worthless. Basically you're a smashed cupcake or a, a smashed flower, licked cupcake, chewed piece of gum, you know, that, that whole thing. And it, that's just all the short was. And, and you know, just the, the idea that a woman's value is more than just whether or not she's been used sexually is still so foreign. The comments on that were overwhelmingly bad and or at least saying like i think this is a good lesson and or or they were like making assumptions about her that if if well if she's saying that lesson is bad then she must be some kind of slut or whore she must be sleeping with everybody because they can't get out of the frame of mind of thinking of a woman as a sexual object so if she's not saving herself well then she's just got to be giving herself away and they did, and it was really disheartening. I went through, I had to clean up, like before I realized like how many comments were coming in on that, like two hours of just cleaning up some really nasty comments on that. And then another one that we've had a lot of comments on was a, a, a clip from a girl named Brinley who talked about being told that she can't wear leggings on her mission by her mission president. And those there were a lot of disgusting comments there too, like leggings aren't pants or a girl wearing leggings is like, is just it is being really insensitive like walking past a homeless starving person while just eating a sandwich and just you know like like she's being so entitled and haughty just to do it and it's like we're talking about a person just existing in their body and the fact that you can see any kind of a shape is so, like somehow something negative being done to you by her just in walking by and it, that it's made out to be this way it it was these kinds of comments are really sad. And then I'll go ahead and put, let's see. Um, Maven, just before you do, I just want to show yeah. folks in case there's any question. This is the missionary, uh, the missionary group, the, of, had. the missionary library and notice the book in the middle, the miracle of forgiveness by Spencer Kimball. So I just wanted people to note that it was 
given to missionaries to read on their mission. And it was one of the approved books they could have. So anyway, go ahead. That's good. I think I'm going to, uh, oh, wait, before actually I put this thing up on stage, I, I remind, I, something I was going to say about uh, with Elder Faust talk and when, you know, when he was talking about the victim blaming, there was a part of me as a teenager because rape was so terrifying or an assault was terrifying. I really wanted to feel like I had some kind of a sense of control. And I was able to feel that by really from the for strength of the youth pamphlet and the standards the church gave. I really felt like, look, I'm, I'm trying to do everything it says in here. I'm trying to have good friends who listen to good music and have good values. So if I have good friends with good values, I'm not with those druggies over there or, or these guys or whatever. If I'm with the right crowd, bad things can't happen to me. And if I wear modest clothing, bad things can't happen to me because I won't be seen as a sexual object by somebody. And that's just not true the amount of clothing a woman is wearing has no bearing on her likelihood to be assaulted or not assault is just as common in you know in, in the islamic countries where women are in full burqas it's it's not it's not about the clothing it's it's really just about the entitlement men have towards women's bodies so um anyway but i i guess i that was his talk with talking about like the victim's responsibility kind of triggered that memory in me. Cause I, I used to, I was already prepared to take on responsibility for an assault. And I have, I've had so many friends who have done that, who've, who've literally like, talked to me about something that happened with a boyfriend or a friend that they didn't want to have happen. And they don't have the words to eat, like even talk about it as an assault or even bring up that it's not something they wanted. Like I've had to ask, I, I had, it, it's actually only a couple of years ago, a woman my age, we're, we're talking mid thirties here, um, had something happen that, that she didn't want. She went along with it, but she was still going like, I, I should have known better. I shouldn't have been at his house. It was late. You know, there's just, there's just all these reasons why it's our fault. And that's how she was talking about it. And so I, I actually genuinely wasn't sure if she had wanted to, if she was feeling guilty, like I slipped up and it was late and I shouldn't have done these kinds of things. Um, and so I, I had to ask her point blank, like, did you want to do that? If you, if you felt you could have just walked out and said no and everything would have been fine, or if he would have stopped, would you have wanted to keep going or would you have stopped and that would have been it? And she was like, I didn't want to do it. If, if he hadn't done, if he hadn't been moving things along, she wouldn't have done any of it. And I just, it just was really sad to me. And then with Mormon stories and also in like personal stories, people tell to me, I, I know so many girls who have, yeah, confessed to bishops sexual activity and it just never even came up, not in their own minds and not in the bishop's mind either to ask if it was consensual, if they wanted it to happen in the first place because it's because of these kinds of teachings it's already embedded like we're the gatekeepers so if something happens to us it is our fault and so it's just i guess i'm seeing like the other side of the coin that if there's things that i can do that make it more likely then then if i'm following the rules that kind of gives me the, a sense of safety um i mean it's not a true sense of safety and unfortunately it's it's a, a false sense of safety that actually puts women in a position where they're easier targets to be taken advantage of by people that they trust because they think that that wouldn't happen. Um, or, you know, because they don't know what the actual real signs and the real things that can help keep them protected. So that was just something that I had forgotten that I used to think like that, that like if I do right and, and I'm praying and I'm reading my scriptures and I have a close relationship with God. So I think he'll protect me and he'll listen. I'll, if I, as long as I'm listening to the Holy ghost, then I can avoid these things from happening. And I just, at that time, that's what I needed for my own sense of, I think, psychological safety. It wasn't until much later and I it had friends have experiences that I really saw the other side of the coin, which is the where the blame comes in, where you think if I'm doing everything right, I'll be safe. Then when you're not safe, you know, and you know, and you believe in a heavenly father that saw that coming and let it happen, it's hard not to think that there's something that you did 
to deserve that. So it's just, um, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm losing my train of thought. No, it gets I, very complicated, doesn't it? It can yeah. get very, very complicated, but all the complications and all the paths end up leading back to the woman being the one who's guilty. Yeah. Yeah. All the pressure, right? I mean, again, right. Mormonism is unhealthy to boys and men in its own way, and, and some of that is really significant. Absolutely, but, absolutely. But the degree to which women are uh, in the dichotomy of men and women, the degree to which women are shamed or made responsible is is so strange and out of balance. Um, I wanted there, to, what to say. Did yeah, you did, I'll go through these things, and then and then I'll. I'll turn it over to you for the last part. Sorry. Thank you for letting me mm, talk totally. about this. Um, I just wish I, I had my mind together more. Like I, I feel like I wish I could be. Um, this was a comment. Um, this was actually, so John Dillon. I mean, I guess you can see it here. This is, this was a comment under this episode with cults to consciousness. John, Dillon, if John Dillon could change the Mormon church. And one of the things he had talked about was this purity culture and modesty culture. And um, this person had commented something like, again, it's just this dichotomy where if we're saying purity culture is bad or modesty is bad, well, then we must be advocating for people to just be walking around naked all the time. And so I tried, I engaged with this person, AA, and tried to explain to them and spell out what some of the problems like that we've talked about tonight. And this was this was a, a comment and he deleted it pretty quickly, but I get them in my inbox. So this is this stayed forever. Um, and I kept it because I just didn't know how to process it. So this was his response. And again, because this came in my email, I don't actually remember what my responses were, just the generic uh, tone of the conversation. But um, but this is that that was the topic. It was about modesty. He says, Maven, let me ask you this. Can I view you as a human being if you're butt naked? And besides having bad grammar, I think I, what really just struck me is how is this even a question? Because I am still human if I am not wearing clothes. I, I think if anything, I'm, I'm probably like my most human feeling, you know, and just the idea that I'm not or that let fewer clothing it just modesty in general equals less human that's the problem that's like he he was just personifying the issues with purity culture and modesty culture right there because he he's saying he can't he can't see me as a human being without clothes but like my body is me that is the human being the clothing is just covers it's just it's just a pillowcase, but it. This is this is the idea behind women being objects or just being lesser. Is is this kind of stuff, um, and it is tough. We we kind of referenced a few things, but I don't think we actually played the clips. So I think I might go, um, backwards here. Actually, I think I might have to switch over. This was, yeah. Okay, I'll put it up here, and. Unmute it. So this is. I don't know. Did you mute it, Bill? It's not letting me unmute. The... It, says I can't. it says either you or RFM has to try. Oh, okay. I'm going to try again. Okay, there we go. All right, I'll go ahead and play this. It's really short. And young women, please understand that if you dress immodestly, you are magnifying this problem by becoming pornography to some of the men who see you. Probably that one, probably that man, because if that's the thoughts on his head, then he's probably thought things that uh, that were really unhealthy. Of course, these guys are prophets, seers, and revelators. They do everything just right. <clears throat> we had just we had alluded to it, and I just wanted to play that clip out. But it's it, I, it can't be any more explicit than that, right? Like you, you are pornography, which it, you know, and women who are sexual, who are promiscuous, are seen as trash and usable and that still includes by like quote unquote good mormon men like i i know someone in a ward of mine 
who was happy to get a BJ in the Walmart parking lot by, you know, another member of the ward who I think had some assault in her in her childhood, which is probably, you know, part of why she was the way she was. But yeah, he, he was happy to get get a little service. And then still a couple months later, marry his return missionary girlfriend, you know, and yeah. this kind of behavior is actually pretty common. It, it's it, it, because Mormon men still they'll they'll want the Madonna. They'll they'll want their pretty package, their unwrapped package. Um, but if someone else has already been unwrapped, you know, and I don't have my package yet. Because I I'm not authorized yet. I haven't been to the temple, so I can I can have my thing now. That this one's already used. I can use this one, and and then toss her away for the for the good woman when it's when I'm ready when it's time. Yeah, I appreciate that, Maven. Again, much throughout this show, having uh, a female perspective, I think was crucial. Um, I want to wrap up. We've gone a little long. I want to wrap up. So if you, if the audience, if you'll give me 10 minutes in uh, RFM and Maven, I, I will try to do this really quickly. Um, and we'll just kind of get through this. But what I wanted to do was take the church's current site and see how healthy it was. And so I just want to note at the website, just to begin with, notice in the URL of Victory for Satan, the church in creating the URL wanted to capitalize on the word Mormons rather than how the church approaches abuse, but the name of the article in the URL is how Mormons approach abuse. So it's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints intentionally using the word Mormons to capitalize on search results when they are telling the rest of the world not to call us that. I find that to be an irony first. Okay, next. Um one part of the site says the church has a zero tolerance policy when it comes to abuse. This means that if we learn of abuse, we cooperate with civil authorities to report and investigate the abuse. They carefully word that in a way that you, the reader, take it that when they discover abuse, they cooperate with law enforcement and they report it. We all know that's not true. If the state allows them not to report it, they don't report it. And I show numerous news articles that demonstrate the fact that they are often in trouble ethically with uh, public opinion for not reporting it. Second, what is that, I'm sorry. I know you got to get to the oh, end of this, but what does what? that even mean that the church cooperates with civil authorities to investigate abuse and to report it? Yeah. And I know that they have the report there, and that's problematic. But what does that even mean? That they're going to help the they're going to help the cops investigate the abuse? Mm -mm. They've already told their the the helpline tells the bishop to keep his mouth shut. Yeah, this believe me, the true. cops don't want the church to help them investigate the abuse. Yeah. They just need the report so they can follow up and do their thing without the church's help. I'm sure there's an instance or two where the church did something that pushed a case along and helped. But by the standard that we're all watching in the modern moment as all these cases unfold over the last decade is that the church isn't reporting and it's get, it's and it's a it's blocking avenues of investigation so that its bishop doesn't get involved. All right, help the victim stop the abuse. This is off the church's website. We train local leaders and provide resources to stop and prevent abuse and to keep individuals safe. How well trained are the lay leadership? Are there background checks? No. What training and how comprehensive is that training? As far as I know, when a new leader is called, they take like a 30-minute online. Some people said they could get it done in 15 minutes. You take an online little uh, training video, watch it, answer some questions, and you are trained. I was a local leader. There's almost no training. I'm, I was a lay leader. All lay, local leaders are lay leaders. I was a carpet salesman serving as a bishop. I didn't. I was 29 years old. I had no idea how to handle abuse. And calling the hotline was the worst thing I probably could have done. And it's not what happened with the AP article. That was the whole thing. This this poor girl had been abused by her father for five years already when the first yeah. first bishop found He's out about it. And he going failed going. to stop it. Yeah. Yep. hundred uh, percent. Help the victim stop the abuse. We provide resources to help members know they are safe to come forward and get help if the abuse has occurred. Except, folks, that the church also 
has a risk management handbook and risk management team. You call the 1-800 number the bishop has to call. And the last thing they're doing is trying to make sure you feel safe and that you can get help. It's instead to protect the legal liability of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Next, same uh, part of the webpage. We urge local leaders and members to reach out to victims, comfort and strengthen them, and help them understand what happened was wrong and that the experience was not their fault. We just talked about all the teachings of the past where leaders do the exact opposite of that, and those are teachings that the church has never formally disavowed. Safeguard. Not, oh, please. That, I just want to say, it's also, it just does not happen, period. There's multiple articles out about how the church consistently, in court cases, in civil and criminal cases, they will be on the side of the defendant. They're never on the side of the victim. And if you go to floodlit.org, there's some really heartbreaking stories there where like literally a, a person's mother, their own, they were alone by themselves on their side of the courtroom for, I, I think it was for the verdict for their um, assailant, but their own mother and their bishop and everyone else that was on the side of the defendant. And communities often rally around the abuser. It happened with Adam Steed, the, the billionaire, like put out these big, huge ads in the paper to, to, uh, draw doubt into the investigation with the Boy Scouts. It's just, it's the reputation. You don't want to hurt the reputation of a, a supposedly good man. And that that was something a Utah judge even said, like convicted a man who had molested children, but the judge who sentenced him and gave him a very light sentence because he knew him said that he was a good man. I'm sorry, you're not a good man if you're molesting children. It's just, there's a huge conflict of interest here. It just doesn't happen, period. Yeah. Um, safeguards to protect. Church facilities are designed to protect against abuse. Since 2006, all classrooms and new chapels and meeting houses have windows so parents and others can help watch over children and keep them safe. I just want to note, except on bishops and clerk's doors, where a grown stranger man who is a lay leader and who the child is taught speaks to God, meets with that child behind that windowless door and asks questions of a sexual nature. So except in that instance, and then why in 2023 are grown stranger men serving as lay leaders allowed to interview children in a religious setting alone with that child? That makes no sense to me. Sam Young tried to get the policy changed. They caved in to say if somebody asked, but the problem is you've taught your members not to ask. You've taught your members to go along with the prescribed way of doing things because you're the one and only true church with which the Lord is well pleased. Just go ahead and make it so there always has to be two adults anytime an adult requests a conversation with a child. That seems simple, um, and you don't do it. Next, when leaders are assigned to teach children and youth, at least two responsible adults should be present at all times, except on a bishop, except in a bishop's office with a bishop or in a clerk's office where a grown stranger man who is a lay leader with a child is able to talk to them and that leader claims to speak to God and meets with that child behind windowless doors and asks questions of a sexual nature. The church says it has two leaders at everything, but it doesn't have two leaders at everything. Two leaders are not present at all times. That's not true. And, and I know you're going, well, yeah, but you know what we mean. In this one particular instance, it's not. Well, in that one particular instance is a safe place for abuse to occur. Next. By the way, uh, I'm so sorry, Bill. Go ahead. But in this church, which is not hurting for money, the vast majority of chapels have been built prior to 2006. What is the problem with going into each of those chapels and simply putting a window in every door? Yeah. What was the article I read this week? They own $200 billion in U.S. farmland. Uh, they have $150 or more billion dollars invested in the stock market, either in the U.S. stock market or across the ocean. This church has plenty of funds. It could put windows. It could put 47 windows in every door. Uh, it could have glass doors and it would be fine. When an individual is identified as a candidate to be called to work with children or youth, the bishop receives a recommendation from other adult leaders. He interviews the individual. He reviews their church membership record. If there's any indication of that person being involved in abusive behavior, that person is disqualified from serving in any capacity with children or youth 
Before serving, the individual is presented to the entire congregation for a sustaining vote. A bishop, by the way, we already know what sustaining votes mean to the church because they ordained President Nelson and ordained uh, Patrick Kieran uh, before ever getting a sustaining vote. So they don't really put much emphasis in them anyway. And it's sprung on everybody. It's all hush-hush, and then it's sprung on them, and then everybody raises their hand. They're acting like this is some kind of a... Uh, a yeah. fail safe or some way to protect so all the people in the ward have to sustain this person and their group knowledge might yeah. ferret out some people who are abusive i don't know maybe but you don't listen to them i mean you don't look at them unless they make a big stink and go and talk to the bishop yeah. they really should be announcing people at least a week if not several weeks in advance of the sustaining so people have a chance to think about it yeah uh and a they bishop don't or, do yeah. what they're saying here it's just another situation where what's what they what's on paper is not what is happening in practice. And I know RFM likes to joke about, about the other podcast, but Mormon Stories has been reporting and hearing victims' stories of abuse, ecclesiastical, sexual, all kinds, since its inception. And for every single one of these highlights here, there's one specific story. I mean, and not just, I mean, a lot of them will cover multiple things, but like there is one that we did for this in particular because an abuser was allowed to be like known to abuse. It was not notated on his record. He was able to move states. He was able to victimize and abuse more kids. And it was it was again the truth tellers in the ward that ended up getting ostracized for trying to get that information out there and and actually stop this exact thing from happening, which is here on the website is as their policy when it's not there's something for like every single one of these things here there's a there's a story on mormon stories of how this just drastically went wrong yeah so so they lay out their process and i want to note they describe this process like it's a high functioning responsible way to sort out abusers from non-abusers but a belief that god talks to you and inspires you on who to call as the young men's president is entirely an ineffective way to know who is an abuser or not an abuser in your ward. That is just their, that's their recommendation. So we all been in the church. Everybody goes off in an organization and prays and they come back and go, I think brother Jones, or I think sister Jensen should serve in this calling. That has nothing to do with what they know about whether that person is really healthy inside. In fact, we've demonstrated that often the unhealthiest among the congregation is the ones that get promoted and work their way up in leadership. Second, uh, do tell, pray thee, what an LDS calling extension interview looks like. I've been involved in th a thousand of them. Uh, Brother Jones, uh, we prayed about uh, the young men's presidency, and we feel inspired to call you. Would you accept that calling? Yes. Done. Now, you can have a bigger conversation, but sometimes you're in a hurry, and that's all that happens because a bishop has a lot to do. Does a sustaining vote, and again, LDS leaders have already diminished that anyway, does a sustaining vote create a responsible space where unhealthy people can be weeded out? RFM, you hit it. it. It isn't. This is not an effective process. Background checks alone would be more effective than this entire process. Um, because anybody who has a past offense would be discovered. We, we can't know who's a good person and who isn't. If we did, then we wouldn't have leaders like uh, President Nelson and Elder Oaks who keep the SEC uh, financial scandal going until they get caught. The system doesn't work. It doesn't promote the healthiest among us. It promotes the most loyal and people willing to compromise their integrity in order to keep the system going. That's who it promotes. All right. Jeff from Analyzing Mormonism had a, a TikTok a while ago where I don't know if this was in her ward or something reported to her that a calling for youth was extended to somebody that did have a record that absolutely would have been caught on a background check. And they were the ones to say, I can't do this. I can't have a calling like this, like because of their parole and their probation. So it was actually the abuser who was turning down the calling. And I just, that was a TikTok that just really stood out to me. And I just want to note, um, Background checks will probably only catch a very small number of unhealthy people who went on to commit abuse in an LDS congregation. But telling people you can communicate with the Holy Ghost and you have the spirit of discernment does 
damage. It's it's like one doesn't work, but the other one works in the negative. It it clouds over all kinds of intuition and healthy sorts of uh, figuring things out in your head and in your gut because you're told to trust the spirit and the spirit doesn't work. It's the and diabolical so, pattern yeah. that like literally a sadist would come up with this system. It would be perfect for someone to deliberately do it that way to cause harm. Yeah. Take somebody who's not able to find abusers by any other means, and then tell them that they can discern with the Holy ghost who's good and who's bad. And they will end up making a situation worse than having been taught and they didn't have the Holy ghost to begin with. It's the ordeal of bitter water again. Yeah. Yep. And you end up, you end up just screwing everybody up. Okay. Uh, record annotations. This, uh, the, these includes annotations for offenses such as abuse. As a bishop, I knew of a grown adult man who had sexually molested uh, his two adopted daughters. They were like his brother's kids and his brother either was incapable of raising them or died. I can't remember what the situation was, but these two girls went into this priesthood holder's home and he sexually abused them when they were children. I met with them as my, as Bishop, I met with both of them, talked to them, knew that this had happened. What did what I thought I was supposed to do as a Bishop, which is go to my state president and say, what do you want me to do? This guy, I have two women in my ward, adult women who are, are now coming forward about their, uh, adopted father sexually abusing them. And it took me like a year and a half of going in to see him every couple of months and imploring him to give this guy an annotation for them to actually do it. He, I think he ended up with one. This process doesn't work that well. Again, the abuser is always going to be seen as innocent until proven guilty. Whereas I think in a church congregational setting, we ought to err on the side of putting an annotation, a little asterisk on someone's thing and allow everyone going forward to at least hear the situation before they put that person in positions of uh, uh, physical space of children or uh, vulnerable people. It seems we should err on that side. This isn't about making somebody guilty and they can't come to church. This is just putting an asterisk on their membership so that right. any future leadership at least raises their hand and go, hey, why is that there? And then they would be explained to them because there would be in this in this record, there is an explanation of why the asterisk. And you could say, we're not 100% sure he's guilty, but this is some of the claims that have been brought. You might not want to have this person be around children. That seems reasonable, but it is a difficult process to get an annotation on a membership uh, member's membership record if the stake president isn't happy to cooperate with you. Uh, anyway. I want to pull up there's a comment I want to, this person saying, yeah, an annotation like, uh, like that's going to stop someone. It's not the yeah. annotation that's going to stop somebody from abusing, but it's the annotation that lets other people know that this is not a safe person with. So no, it's, it's, it's one thing to, to say that you, you can't always prevent someone from harming another person, but you can at least not give a known abuser a vulnerable person, a child, elderly, anybody on a silver platter and serve them up to them like that. So yeah, yeah the yeah. annotation, if if they were actually doing these things could absolutely help, but they don't. Al although they do, I have heard, I have been very quick with annotations for homosexuality and they will put that on quicker and enforce that and, and consider that a danger to children and 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 stop someone from any callings there because yeah yeah that's exactly what the person on the screen there is saying is that if if someone was gay they'd have an annotation immediately if i i can guarantee you the moment i started to be vocal about my church criticism uh while being active i had an annotation on my membership record um who the church chooses to weed out or to marginalize as a threat isn't the people that we should be marginalizing as a threat when we look at things in, from a societal perspective. Um, all right, I want to just note, I really wanted to highlight this whole section, so I just highlighted the, the title at the top. Professional helpline. The church established a helpline. If you call it a helpline, it must be a helpline. In 1995, to connect church leaders with a professional counselor and legal professionals and to ensure compliance 
with abuse reporting laws. If a bishop branch president or stake president suspects or learns of abuse, he is instructed to call a helpline number. Where available, he will be in put he will be put in touch with a professional counselor to help the victim stop the abuse and prevent abuse of others. The bishop will also be connected with a lawyer to make certain that all legal reporting requirements are observed. <clears throat> How carefully worded is that section? Does the helpline operate the way the reader would interpret this section? No, it doesn't. Would the reader grasp that the priority is to protect the church legally? No, it wouldn't. This is dishonest. This is what deceptive, carefully worded uh, articulations look like. This is not the church being sincere or honest about how it handles abuse. Help the victim stop the abuse. The abuse. Our first priority is to help the victim and stop the abuse. So my question is, could the church please explain how it accomplishes this as the first priority when its helpline is mandated to be called first and that helpline directs the call to the church's risk management team who enact the risk management playbook? It can't. You're lying through your teeth. You will always choose to protect the church over protecting the victim, and that shows up all the time in these lawsuits. And that, my friends, is the LDS Church, past teachings, and present problems in regards to how they handle abuse. And I don't have a phone line ready, Maven. I know we had some issues last week, and I had some the week before with mine. So I probably think it's just best that we skip the phones as late as we've been. But I did want to give the two of you a chance to give any last thoughts, as I think we've shown the church still has a lot of work to do. Yeah, I just wanted to point out again um, that stopping the abuse is not what they did for the recent for the AP, the Arizona Bisbee case. And they that they appealed that I think it went through the Arizona Supreme Court. This is the one where the church came out with a statement because the the court sided with the church with Curtin McConkie that they were not legally required to mandate to report that abuse, which would have stopped it seven years, seven years earlier. Um, this was the statement where they said that they were pleased to say that they were within the bounds of the law, that that's what that was found. And so I just don't see how anyone can be pleased with an outcome knowing that you, you not only did you not stop the abuse, but you you enabled it to happen for another seven years. That's just such a long, long, long time on top of five that she had already been through. I just, I can't imagine. Plus the and new I, baby born. Plus the new baby. Yeah. And then there was a comment, uh, someone kind of mentioned about, we didn't even go over this, but just like within marriages, when we were going through all, all, all of these rape circumstances, I think most of them was kind of assumed that it would be a stranger or someone outside of the marriage. And yeah, that just, I, I feel bad that wasn't even touched on because that's a whole nother thing that isn't also seen as a priority. Um, when you are married, there is an entitlement there. And it was a, a Utah state Senator even that hesitated about a bill that was trying to, um, that was trying to pass to kind of tighten down the legal definition of rape for Utah. And the part that he didn't like was the part about it, uh, specifying that an unconscious, an unconscious person cannot be consenting. And one of the things he said, well, you know, like, what if it, you know, what if it's your wife or, you know, like the, if, if we pass this, then that means that you could have sex with your wife when she's sleeping and you could get arrested for spousal rape. And, this was again just a couple of years ago where it's just like this guy is a politician, he's in a place of power who does not see or does not understand consent in a really really crucial way. Anyway, it's it, it's a problem also within marriages. Yeah. Arthur. And thank you guys for letting me. I had so many thoughts and they were I lo a lot more disjointed than I wanted them to be, but I I appreciate you letting me I share my story it. and take us over. Yeah. I appreciate and I know you were nodding to me, Bill, but I cannot say anything that would add anything to what Maven has said tonight. Um, I'll just finish then by saying like, it's, you have plenty of places where you can make the processes around how the church works at the local level. You can make them 
not only safer so that abuse doesn't occur, easy one is mandate that anytime leadership is asking a youth or a woman to have an interview, that there be two adults in the room. That That's simple. Um, so you have lots of things you can do to make the church safer in the here and now. You're not the gold standard. In, in fact, I'd get tetanus from what you are. But what but what what I would like to really point out is that um, one of the things you could do that would go so far is to stop needing past leaders to be on pedestals or only at a surface level say like, oh, well, they're fallible. They, they might have made some mistakes. Instead, start naming. I know it's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cause people to lose trust in you. But guess what? You weren't trustworthy to begin with because once the truth is out, you're not trustworthy. The only way you maintain trust is a facade of pretending leaders are more perfect than they are. So just tell the truth because it is the truth is whatever it is. Tell the truth. Stand up and be honest about what past leaders have said and acknowledge that in all likelihood, the results are that Prophet, seers, and revelators have really, on a abysmal level, been prophetic. On a really atrocious level, have they been revelatory? Almost all the things that leaders have taught have either been abandoned, changed, disavowed, swept under the rug, and at worst, they've done and said really horrible things that you fail to allow the church to be accountable for. And I think there's a whole hell of a lot of improvement you can make. And uh, here's my hope, LDS Church, that you do better.